subcommittee on employment and housing will please come to order. This morning, the Employment and Housing Subcommittee resumes its hearings on abuses, favoritism, and mismanagement in HUD programs during the stewardship of HUD Secretary Pierce. The witness at today's hearing is Mr. Du Bois Gilliam, who served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Program Policy Development and Evaluation at HUD from April 1984 until September 1987. Mr. Gilliam will be testifying under an order of immunity issued by the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia on March 30th. Under the grant of immunity, Mr. Gilliam's testimony and any information directly or indirectly derived <coughs> from such testimony may not be used against him in a subsequent criminal case. However, he may still be prosecuted on the basis of other evidence. Furthermore, Mr. Gilliam can be prosecuted for perjury or giving a false statement before this subcommittee. Mr. Gilliam is a 1975 graduate of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Before coming to HUD in April 1984, Mr. Gilliam worked for four years as Director of Human Relations and Assistant Labor Relations Director for the City of Council Bluffs, Iowa, followed by five years of service as the Director of Special Grants for the Governor of Nebraska. As uh, HUD Deputy Assistant Secretary for Program Policy, Development and Evaluation, Mr. Gilliam was a key player in the administration of the Technical Assistance Program and special projects, both of which were funded through the Secretary's discretionary fund, as well as the Urban Development Action Grant Program, commonly known as the UDAC Program. <coughs> In 1987, Mr. Gilliam was set to succeed Deborah Dean as Executive Assistant to HUD Secretary Pierce. However, his career at HUD was derailed by allegations of criminal wrongdoing. <coughs> Last year, Mr. Gilliam pled guilty to accepting gratuities in the form of $8,100 in cash and a family vacation valued at $4,900 from a person in the Virgin Islands who received a $600,000 HUD grant. And to conspiracy to defraud the government in using his position and influence to steer federal funds to a project in Biloxi, Mississippi. Mr. Gilliam is currently serving an 18 months prison sentence. He is eligible for parole in June and his mandatory release date is only nine months away. Since uh, Mr. Gilliam is such a critical witness in our investigation of how certain housing programs were administered at HUD, and in order to give subcommittee members ample time to question Mr. William, additional hearings will be held this Wednesday and Friday. In an effort to focus our inquiry better, and to avoid the confusion that can result from jumping too quickly from program to program, each day of our hearings will focus on a specific program. Today's hearing will focus on the so-called UDAG program, Urban Development Action Grant Program. On Wednesday, we will examine special projects and other programs, including Section 8 moderate rehabilitation programs. And on Friday, we will deal with the technical assistance program. <coughs> the UDAC program was created by Congress in 1977 to stimulate development in economically distressed cities and urban areas. Among the factors considered in measuring an urban community's economic condition 
are housing stock, per capita income, and unemployment. UDAG grants are made by HUD to local governments, which in turn use the funds to make loans to private developers for projects that benefit the unemployed and help revitalize blighted areas. The previous administration tried for many years to kill the UDAG program and finally succeeded in fiscal year 1989. <clears throat> Funding for the UDAG program was reduced from $675 million in fiscal 81 to $216 million in fiscal 88. Former Office of Management and Budget Director David Stockman called the UDAG program, and I quote, the most ideologically offensive and wasteful bit of spending on the block, end quote. <clears throat> we are here today not to debate the merits of the UDAG program, but to examine how the program was administered by HUD during the tenure of Mr. Pierce. We will hear testimony today from Mr. Gilliam about the UDAG program, how Secretary Pierce manipulated the level of UDAG funding <coughs> to benefit a project promoted by his former executive assistant, Lance Wilson, how Secretary Pierce personally approved the transfer of a dedicated career HUD employee for having the temerity to question an apparently fraudulent UDAC commitment letter submitted by Lance Wilson while he was working at Payne Webber, and the role of the Office of Management and Budget in the UDAC process. Since the UDAC program was supposed to be administered on a strict numerical formula, it was believed to be immune from political influence and manipulation. That, however, was not the case. At today's hearing, we will get an insider's view of the games people played at HUD and at OMB with the Urban Development Action Grant Program. Friends of Secretary Pierce and the politically well-connected received special treatment and personalized services that would make the department store Nordstrom envious. On one occasion, HUD Deputy Assistant Secretary Gilliam took Lance Wilson, former executive assistant to Mr. Pierce, and then a Payne Weber uh, vice president, <coughs> with him to visit the would-be UDAG applicant to assist them in any underwriting needs. Talk about one-stop financial services. It appears that one of the UDAG games played by HUD Secretary Pierce was a form of the price is right. The secretary would be given a typed list of the UDAG projects that were eligible for funding. The UDAGs would be listed in order of point scores with the best projects those with the highest scores on top. There would be a cutoff line on the list based on the planned level of funding. Thus, for example, if HUD planned to spend $60 million in a particular UDAC selection round, it would go down the list in order until $60 million in UDAC projects had been funded. And that should be the cutoff point. Handwritten on, secretary, on the secretary's copy of the list would be a notation of who was behind, who was supporting, who was promoting <coughs> each urban development action grant. The decision on where to draw the line often depended on who wanted the project funded. Thus, for example, <coughs> if a friend of Secretary Pierce an influential consultant, or in some cases, a particular member of Congress had a specific project that they wanted funded, and the project fell below the cutoff line, HUD would simply increase the level of funding and move the cutoff line in order to reach down to the list all the way to the specific project. It would appear that the slogan at HUD was, reach down and help someone. 
these additional funds would come from money budgeted for late, later selection rounds. It appears that Secretary Pierce would discuss this list with OMB officials before deciding the appropriate level of funding. Now, Congress put an end to this practice by HUD as part of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1987, which became law in February 1988. This legislation required HUD at the start of each fiscal year to announce the number of founding round competitions and apportion an equal amount of funding for each round. This had the effect of eliminating the movable cutoff line since HUD was no longer able to shift funds from later UDAG selection rounds to reach down the earlier UDAG list. As I indicated previously, these hearings with Mr. Gilliam will continue later this week. On Wednesday, we will hear testimony from Mr. Gilliam about special projects. How a particular project was funded at the request of someone in the office of <coughs> the Vice President in order to get a Hispanic leader to accompany the then Vice Pre President on a plane trip to Puerto Rico. While Mr. Gilliam had no program responsibility for the administration of Section 8 moderate rehabilitation programs, we will also hear testimony on Wednesday about how Mr. Gilliam, as the executive assistant in training, was able to <laughs> sit in on an April 87 Mod Rehab Selection Committee meeting and in the process help dole out several hundred Mod Rehab units to friends. On Friday, we will be hearing testimony from Mr. Gilliam about the technical assistance program, how one organization obtained a technical assistance grant with the apparent help of Secretary Pierce's brother. Our Secretary Pierce directed, directed Mr. Gilliam to give a technical assistance grant to Pierce's friend and former campaign manager, and how Mr. Gilliam in his capacity as HUD Deputy Assistant Secretary, had to travel to New Jersey with this individual to convince skeptical local officials that HUD was really prepared to award the grant to this individual's company, notwithstanding its inexperience, and how the determining factor in awarding technical assistance grants was on the particular people behind each project, rather than on the quality of the project. Congressman Kyle. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In Mr. Du Bois Gilliam, we finally have an insider who's willing to testify, and that should provide us with an opportunity to learn additional details about exactly what happened with respect to several important projects at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Specifically, the information should give us a better understanding of the role of Secretary Pierce and Deborah Dean, as well as others. The information, I hope, will be useful to assist us and the Department of, Interior, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development today, the current department, in determining what additional policy changes are necessary for the operation of the department and the implementation of the programs that it operates. I'm looking forward to the testimony today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no <coughs> comments. Mr. Gilliam, if you'll come up to the witness table, I would like to swear you in. You raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Please be seated. Thanks. We appreciate your, we appreciate your being here, uh, Mr. Gilliam. And as you know, uh, before we begin your formal testimony, uh, 
we shall proceed with what is referred to as the immunity ceremony. Mr. Gilliam, in conversations that subcommittee staff had with you earlier this year <coughs> at Lompoc Prison in California, you stated that if you were summoned to testify before the subcommittee, you would exercise your constitutional rights and assert your Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Is that correct, sir? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mindful of your intention to assert constitutional privilege if called to testify before this subcommittee, on March 13, 1990, this subcommittee and the full Government Operations Committee voted unanimously to seek a court order which compels you to testify and grants you immunity against the use of your testimony in a subsequent criminal prosecution. Immunity is considered to provide a witness with the constitutional equivalent of Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. I am now going to formally communicate the U.S. District Court order to you. <coughs> In the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, House Subcommittee on Employment and Housing, U.S. House of Representatives, Washington, D.C. Order. Upon consideration of the application by the House Subcommittee on Employment and Housing of the Committee on Government Operations and the Memorandum of Points and Authorities and Exhibits in support thereof, the Court finds that the procedural requisites sets, set forth in 605 for an order of the court have been satisfied. Accordingly, it is ordered that Du Bois Gilliam may not refuse to provide any evidence in proceedings before the House Subcommittee on Employment and Housing on the basis of his privilege against self-incrimination. And it is further ordered that no evidence under this order or any information directly or indirectly derived from such evidence may be used against Du Bois Gilliam in any criminal case except a, except a prosecution for perjury, giving a false statement <clears throat> or otherwise failing to comply with this order. Further ordered that this order shall become effective on April 16, 1990, signed by the United States District Judge on March 30th, um, 1990. 90. I would like to send down to you a copy of this uh, court order, Mr. Gilliam. <coughs> Mr. Gilliam, do you have an opening statement, sir? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I do have an opening statement I'd like to read to the committee please, at this time. Please proceed. Uh, Congressman Shays. Um, I'm just curious, you're appearing without an attorney? Without counsel this morning, yes, I am. Thank you. And uh, my second question to you relates to the immunity issue. Did you feel it was necessary for us to give you immunity in order for you to testify? Yes, Mr. Shays. Okay. And you would not testify if you were not given immunity? No, I would not. Thank you, Congressman Shays. Mr. Gilliam, please proceed. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I have an opening statement. I first of all, I'd like to say good morning to you and the rest of the committee members. Good morning to you, too, sir. Mr. Chairman, I am the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Program Policy, Development, and Evaluation of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. I served in this capacity from April 1984 until September 1987. Prior to my arrival, I had served as Director of Human Relations of the City of Council Bluffs, Iowa, Director of Government Special Grants for the State of Nebraska <coughs> under Governor Charles Stone, the Vice President of News and Construction Company located in Omaha, Nebraska, President of Du Bois Industries, a small independent oil company in Omaha, Nebraska. My political involvement started as chairman of the Douglas County Young Republicans in Omaha, Nebraska in 1978. From there, I became active in the statewide Republican races, and in 1980, I was named the state chairman for Blacks for Reagan. Later that, that year, I was named Midwest chairman for Blacks for Reagan. While employed at the agency, my program responsibilities consisted of the Urban Development Action Grant Program, the Secretary Discretionary Fund, 
which consisted of technical assistance, special projects, block grant funds for the Indian and Trust Territories, those Trust Territories being the Pacific Islands and Virgin Islands. My other responsibilities were policy evaluation and environmental. I also had the responsibility for the phase out of the HUD New Communities Program. In September of 1987, I resigned from the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development because of an ongoing investigation involving wrongdoing on my part. I was later charged with two counts of accepting gratuities and one count of conspiracy to defraud the United States government. I am presently serving an 18-month sentence at Lompoc Federal Prison for those wrongdoings. As a part of my plea agreement with the United States of America, which was entered into in 1989, it requires me to cooperate <coughs> with any ongoing investigation by the United States government. But it does not require me to waive my Fifth Amendment rights granted to me under the United States Constitution. In December of 1989, Mr. Stuart Weisberg of your subcommittee staff contacted me at Lompoc Federal Prison Camp and indicated that he wanted to interview me regarding the Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing Investigation into HUD Mismanagement and Abuse. Later that month, I met with Mr. Weisberg and Celia Boddington of your subcommittee staff. At that meeting, I stated that as required by my plea agreement, I am willing to cooperate in this committee's investigation, but I would not waive my Fifth Amendment rights. I am today before this committee to testify under those conditions. My testimony during these hearings will cover my involvement in the Urban Development Action Grant Program, the Secretary Discretionary Fund, and Community Plan Development, which includes technical assistance and special projects grants, Section 8 Moderate Rehabilitation Program, the existing Section 8 Housing Development Action Grants, and the Secretary Discretionary 202 Elderly Housing Units and the Organization of HUD. In addition, I will answer any other questions the committee may have regarding the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development during my tenure. This is the end of my statement, Mr. Chairman, and I am ready to begin accepting questions at your pleasure. Thank you very much, Mr. Gilliam. Your statement, of course, will be part of the record. May I begin by asking you, how did you come to work at HUD? My understanding is that uh, the Department of Labor was your first choice, that you were under consideration for the position of director of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, but you didn't get that position. Can you explain to us why? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in 1984, in the early part of 1984, I was being considered for director of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance. <coughs> this is the area of the Department of Labor that has oversight responsibility for those contractors that do business with the United States government. I had interviews with five different individuals, former Secretary Raymond Donovan, former Attorney General Edward Meese, who at that time was General Counsel to the President, Brad Reynolds, who was the Assistant uh, Attorney General for Civil Rights. I also had an interview with Clarence Thomas, who at that time was Chairman of the EEOC Commission, and Clarence Equal Employment Opportunity, Opportunity Commission, Commission, and Clarence Pendleton, who was Chairman of the Civil Rights Commission. At that in, in, these were five separate interviews. And during my interview with these different groups, they indicated that the position that I would be holding was a very important link in the chain of conducting and carrying out the civil rights policies of the Reagan administration. They asked me, did I believe in quotas? I indicated to them, how do you think I got this far? Yes, I do believe in quotas. And yes, I do believe in a strong affirmative action program. So as a result of my interview with those groups, I did not receive that position because they felt that I would be a weak link in the civil rights organization, policy organization. So therefore, there was strong backing behind me from that group as well as other members to go to HUD and work in which I subsequently did. What were your program responsibilities as HUD Deputy Assistant Secretary for Program Policy Development and Evaluation, Ms. Gilliam? When I first arrived at HUD in April of 1984, my program responsibilities consisted of the Secretary of Discretionary Funds, which I've indicated earlier, included technical assistance funds, special projects funds, trust territories funds, and the Indian Block Grant funds. In addition to that, I had the Office of Policy Evaluation that set the policy tone for community planning and development. And in later, in, later, in later years, in 1985, in July of 1985, I assumed the program of Urban Development Action Grant Program, which I administered and added to my portfolio. So I had three programs while at the agency, UDAG, 
Secretary Discretionary Funds, and Policy Evaluation. Ms. Gilliam, in an interview with uh, Time magazine, which appeared in the September 18, <coughs> 1989 issue, Secretary Pierce said the following, and I quote, my decisions were based on facts, law, and logic, not on political party, end quote. Do you agree with that statement? No, Mr. Chairman. Could, could you expand? The policies during the years when I was at the Department of Housing and Urban Development dealt explicitly with political favoritism, especially in the areas of the Secretary of Discretionary Funds. These areas would be existing Section 8, Moderate Rehabilitation Program, Urban Development Action Grant Program, Special Projects, and the Technical Assistance Areas. Can you pull the mic a little closer to you, sir? Both of them. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly now? It's <laughs> okay. Can you hear me all right? It's better now. All right, thank you. It's better now. <coughs> I'm sorry, would you mind repeating this answer because we couldn't hear you? <laughs> During my years. My, my question uh, is let me repeat my question and, um, and maybe then you can respond. In an interview with Time magazine, which appeared in the September 18, 1989 issue, Secretary Pierce said the following, and I'm quoting him. My decisions were based on facts, law, and logic, not on political party, end quote. Do you agree with that statement? No, Mr. Chairman. I, I do not agree with that statement because during the times in which I worked with Secretary Pierce from 1984 until 1987 with he and Deborah Dean in dealing with the Secretary of Discretionary Funds programs in these particular areas, existing Section 8 certificates, moderate rehabilitation program, Secretary of Discretionary Funds that dealt specifically with technical assistance and special projects, and the Urban Development Action Grant Program and the Mod Rehab Program. We, in those years, dealt basically on political favoritism. If you were well-connected in political circles, then your applications were giving strong, strong, favorable consideration. <coughs> At our earlier HUD hearings, the impression that the subcommittee got from testimony was that Secretary Pierce was not directly involved in funding decisions. At our May 25 hearing, Congressman Shays asked the Secretary, and I'm quoting Congressman Shays, did you ever ask Deborah Gordine to fund a particular project and convey that to anyone else? end quote from Congressman Shays. The secretary under oath responded, I'm quoting him now, not that I recall. I don't remember telling her to fund any. I never told these people to fund anything, end quote. We were also given the impression that Deborah Dean, the secretary's executive assistant, was the real power and made the funding decisions without Secretary Pierce's knowledge and approval. Having worked closely with both of these individuals for several years at HUD, based on your observations and based on your experience, Mr. Gilliam, can you tell us who really made the funding decisions and describe the relative roles of Secretary Pierce and Deborah Dean? Yes, Mr. Chairman. As you well know, Deborah served as executive assistant to the secretary. And in my capacity, the program portfolio that I had allowed me to develop a close working relationship with the both of them. In that capacity, I know for a fact that the secretary made decisions as it related to existing Section 8 certificates, the discretionary part of those funds, the Section 8 mod rehab, the technical assistance program, the special projects programs, and moderate rehabilitation programs. Deborah Dean felt very insecure in her capacity as an executive assistant to the secretary. We were not allowed to spend any funds out of his discretionary funds without first clearing it through him. And every time we removed any units out of the building, any time we wanted to move any funds in the secretary discretionary funds that relate to CPD programs, such as special projects and TA, we had to clear that with Mr. Pierce first. Ms. 
Gilliam, allow me to, to ask a very basic question. Why are you testifying here today? What's, what's in it for you? I have no deal, Mr. Chairman, first of all. I'm here testifying as a result of my plea agreement it requires me to cooperate with any ongoing investigation by the United States government. When my parole eligibility does come up in June, although they will look at, the, at my track record on upholding that plea agreement, and uh, this will be mentioned as the fact that I have cooperated with this committee and with other ongoing investigations as it relates to programs in HUD. <coughs> Ms. Gilliam, with respect to the Urban Development Action Grant Program, could you describe the purposes of the program, the basic eligibility criteria, and what was meant in the program by the phrase pocket of poverty? The Urban Development Action Grant Program, Mr. Chairman, as you stated earlier, was developed to assist those jurisdictions throughout the United States who are experiencing severe lack of economic development. The UDAG program was developed to aid these jurisdictions in its recovery. So therefore, we would provide some investment incentive for private dollars to be leveraged in those areas. The program itself targeted areas of the country that had an older housing stock pre-1940 construction. It also targeted areas of the country that had a high rate of poverty, those people earning money below the national poverty guideline. It also targeted areas that had high unemployment, and a lack of growth as far as its population. As you well know, during the late 70s, early 80s, there was a lot of flight from urban areas uh, because of crime and a lack of growth. And so therefore, those communities lost a lot of revenue. So the UDAC program helped those cities through that recovery period. A pocket of poverty itself was started as a result for those cities and our urban communities that, that did not qualify under the minimum standards of the UDAC criteria, but they did have areas that had these pockets of poverty. So that section was created so they could participate in the UDAC program, sir. <coughs> Ms. Gilliam, it would be very helpful to, to the subcommittee if you would very slowly, very carefully walk us through the UDAC selection process, beginning with the announcement of a, founding, of, of a funding round. Let's, uh, let's go through a round. Our application process would take 60 days. Let's start if application was due in by July 31st of right. the given calendar year. The application would be submitted to the field office in that jurisdiction's locality area, and a copy of that application would be forwarded to the central office in Washington, D.C. During that month of August, that application would be reviewed by the field offices as far as economic impaction, uh, any environmental questions, et cetera. They would do their uh, due diligence in the field and give any field comments that they may have regarding the marketplace as well. Later in the month of August, or the first week of September, shortly after Labor Day, the UDAG staff members in the central office who had, were divided up into 10 regions of the country would span out to the different 10 regions and meet with local officials to go over their, their application. This is a preliminary meeting leading up to their application and being reviewed in what we call PRPs, Project Review Panel. On the 15th of that month of September, on or before 6 o'clock p.m., due in our office are the firm financial commitments for these projects, i.e., I'm a UDAG developer who is asking HUD to provide a million dollars. I've already raised financing for $8 million. The total cost of the project is 9.2. I'm putting $200,000 up in my own equity. I need a firm financial commitment from an institution, financial institution, whether it's an investment banking concern or a commercial banking concern. They have to make a commitment to underwrite the project and finance it, and that commitment is due in by the 15th of that, of that month. Following that firm financial commitment coming into our office, we would then begin to line up what we call PRP, Project Review Panels. We would go over the projects doing due diligence. On one side of the table would be the actual UDAG staff who have done the due diligence on the project. On the other side of the table would be myself, along with the director of the UDAG program, another member of his staff, and counsel for the UDAG program. 
we will begin to go over the repayment terms as far as financial structure, any residuals, kickers, or participation on the part of a local unit of government. Completing that due diligence period, which really took about three days, our project review panel took about three days. At the completion of that three days, we would run what we call our first draft of a list. That list would come out, we review that list to see who our eligible funding projects are at that time. Let's say we have $150 million worth of eligible funding projects. We only have $80 million worth of funding left. Then we have to take in consideration as to what projects do we want to reach at that point. And if necessary, instead of announcing a UDAG round at the end of September 30th, if we wanted to reach certain projects that we did not have enough resources to reach, then we would move over to October 1st during the next calendar year. So that's an example of how a UDAG round would work. That's, <coughs> that's very interesting. Uh, let me, let me uh, take it over into another arena so I'll be sure we all understand it. <coughs> let's assume that, uh <coughs> let's assume that we are talking about uh, college admissions and uh, the college admissions office uh, gives certain number of points for academic grades, certain number of points for test scores, certain number of points for athletic achievements, other achievements. And they rank all of these applicants to the college <coughs> in terms of the number of points they got. Let's say the maximum number of points is 1,000. And uh, it goes down from there. And let's assume that the college plans to take in 500 freshmen. And as they go down that list, when they hit number 500, there are still some people below that the college wants to admit for whatever special reasons of influence. So what that what would happen then, the college would merely go below that and take in additional people until they reach all of the ones who have special influence and special favor. This would be somewhat analogous to what you're talking about. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> now, let us assume that a <coughs> big name, de <coughs> a big name developer, whom I shall call Celia, uh, is a person that uh, either Secretary Pierce or, or you want to take care of. How was the system manipulated to give Celia special treatment? What I would do is let's take, for example, if Celia is doing a $30 million development. She of is actually. 30, of that $30 million, she needs $4 million in UDAC. It boils down to the fact that she's going to be putting up $26 million in the form of either uh, money from an institution or the portion of that being her own equity. What I would do is bring that person in. They would first start dealing with the staff people, and they would put some restrictive terms that would not be what I would call fair market uh, interest rates or fair uh, rate of return to an investor. They would come and see me. I would sit down with them and I'd go over some terms that I thought would make the project cash flow easy. For example, instead of paying a 8 or 7 percent loan over a 15 or 20 year amortization period, I would structure the loan whereby that developer would pay a zero interest non amortizing loan with the principal balloon due in year 15. In addition, what I would do is also instruct that developer that upon closeout of the grant application, upon the completion of your project, after the inspector general close out your audit, you then approach the city and indicate to them that unless they're willing to forgive your loan today, you're going to have to walk away from the project, which could cost a loss of jobs or housing for a group of people. So in essence, what they would do is get the $4 million grant without any repayment structure. I would also allow them if they attempted to resale or refinance the project, 
to transfer the UDAG funds over to the next ownership, which would be an incentive to any group who would be looking for tax shelters or syndication program. Basically, your testimony is that if the secretary wanted to give somebody a special favor, the rules and regulations and procedures and conditions could be so manipulated that this project would appear feasible when in fact it was not feasible. Yes, that would be done for either that if the secretary wanted a particular project funded or if one of the consultants on the project was well connected politically. I understand. You understood, uh, Mr. Gilliam, that the Urban Development Action Grant System very well. And you had the technical ability to move a UDAG project through the system. Is that correct, sir? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Did Secretary Pierce ever direct you to fund a particular UDAG project, to take care of a project, or to make sure that it was on the fundable list? Yes, Mr. Chairman. There were two projects that he indicated to me that he wanted funded throughout my time at the agency. Those two projects on this particular case were the Hampton Institute project in Hampton, Virginia, Hampton University, better known, and also a project in Pittsfield, Massachusetts involving a garage, parking garage structure. Now we will focus on these projects a little later in your testimony. I'd like to ask a related question at this point. Did Secretary Pierce ever tell you not to fund a particular UDAG application? Can you tell us where the project uh, was located, if there was such a case, and we why the Secretary <coughs> didn't want the project uh, funded? We had a project in San Antonio, Texas that came before us that was on the edge of either doing or not doing. I got a call from Representative Gonzalez's office indicating their support in one of this project. San Antonio, Texas, what we call a pocket of poverty uh, uh, eligible community. I contacted the secretary and informed him that I had just received a call from Gon Congressman Gonzalez's office. And this project, we could either go forward with it or we could let it die at this point. The secretary says, does Gonzalez want the project? I said, yes, Mr. Secretary. The secretary's response was, well, Gonzalez don't got the project. And he hung up the phone, and I just let the project die at that point. Well, let me just uh, ponder over this uh, a moment. Um, you had a project in your office which was right on the margin. You really didn't have to manipulate it to get it onto the list or to get it off the list. It could have qualified, and, and, uh, and if somebody wanted to kill it, it could have been killed. And your testimony under oath is that uh, Mr. Pierce asked you, does G Gonzalez want it? And you said yes, and he says, well, Gonzalez don't got it. That's is correct. That and then he hung up but the, phone. the English wasn't quite correct, but we, we, <laughs> got, the, we got the message clearly. I hung up the phone, that's the end of the conversation, the project died. Project died. In October of 86, you and your wife uh, traveled to New York City for a weekend. And I believe you stayed at the Helmsley Palace Hotel. May I ask who paid for that uh, uh, visit? Lance Wilson. Under what uh, category did Mr. Lance Wilson pay for that? How, how did that come about? Well, I indicated to Lance that uh, my wife and I were coming to, <coughs> want to come to New York for the weekend, uh, and Lance made available to us a uh, uh, limousine service, uh, hotel accommodations, and some tickets to uh, see Cats, the theater, see the movie Cats. When you were at HUD, and went out of town and wanted the limousine service in general, who would pay for that? Michael Karam would. Who is Michael Karam? Michael Karam was a, a HUD consultant uh, who had, in the early years, um, in 1980, 81, 82, worked at the department as a deputy assistant secretary for multifamily housing. 
He was also very active in the um, original uh, Reagan circle, working towards his presidential uh, elections. And uh, Michael made those type of accommodations available to me when I wanted to move about within the city to airport and back home when I was traveling on personal business. So basically, Mr. Kerem and Mr. Lance Wilson provided with limousine provided you with limousine service and and uh, hotel rooms and this sort of thing. Yes, as, Mr. as you traveled around. What did Lance Wilson get in return? What services did you provide him? I always tried to help Lance Wilson on any project that came before me. I always gave an extra effort because of, of my association with Lance. Would you say you went beyond the normal duties that you have in, in dealing with uh, the public, in helping Mr. Wilson? Yes, I did, Mr. Chairman. Is it fair to say that perhaps you were also looking to the future and to possible business ventures after leaving HUD? Yes, I was, Mr. Chairman. Let me turn to some of the urban development action grants that uh, Mr. Lance Wilson was involved with. In March of 1987, HUD awarded a $5.6 million UDAG grant in Belglade, Florida to a project belonging to a developer by the name of Leonard Briscoe. Um, in January of 87, did you have a conversation with Mr. Wilson concerning his inability to line up firm financing for that project? Yes, I did, Mr. Chairman. In January, me and Lance talked about the Briscoe project in Belglades, Florida. In that project, Mr. Briscoe was going to need a little over $7 million in private finances. As you well know, at that time, at the end of 1986, the tax laws changed. Yes which no longer allowed the use of tax-exempt bonds and financing housing projects. So therefore, there was going to be issue from paying Weber on taxable bonds. The difficulty on issuing taxable bonds on housing projects in that part of the country where the market was soft, the income was low, was that most investment banking institutions would require you to have a line of credit or an enhancement on those bonds to give them good rating for placement purposes. I indicated to Lance, that how was Payne Weber going to do it. He indicated to me that he would issue a firm financial commitment letter, but they would not be able to stand behind that letter following the award of the UDAC grant. So I indicated to Lance... Let me, let me stop you right there for a minute. <laughs> Is it your testimony, sir, that Lance Wilson told you that Payne Weber would issue a letter of financial commitment, but that in fact that letter of financial commitment would be fraudulent because once they have gotten the commitment, they would not stand behind it. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. We used that letter to get the project past the crucial 15th deadline so it could be on the list for consideration of funding, knowing that this financial commitment would later be replaced with a, with a, with a more firmer committed financial group at that time. This is analogous, is it not, to person going to a bank and uh, asking a million dollar loan on a project, and the bank would say, well, we'll give you a half a million, but you've got to have a firm commitment from another bank for a half a million before we give you ours. And you go to a second bank and work out a phony commitment, a phony commitment, which subsequently then is canceled, and you go back to the first bank and get your half a million, and then the, the phony commitment it just, just goes out the window. Is, would that be analogous? That's a good analogy. So the commitment that Lance Wilson who was a high-ranking official of uh, Payne Weber, uh, provided, was not a legitimate commitment. It was not a firm commitment, no, sir.
Let me show you a firm financial commitment letter to you from Mr. Wilson on behalf of Payne Weber, dated January 29, 1987, with respect to Bell Glade. Had Payne Weber, in fact, made a firm commitment, or was this a fraudulent commitment letter proffered by Mr. Wilson <coughs> to keep the project alive? <coughs> Please take the time to read the letter. Chair will read the letter. This is on Payne Weber stationery, dated January 29, 1987. To Honorable Du Bois Gilliam, Deputy Assistant Secretary, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Washington, D.C., Ray Belglade, Development, Mr. Leonard Briscoe, General Partner. Dear Mr. Gilliam, Payne Weber is pleased to issue its firm commitment subject to the award of an Urban Development Action Grant to underwrite taxable bonds in the amount of $7,680,000, which will provide construction and permanent financing for the above captioned development. Payne Weber will purchase the bonds for its own account or for reoffering. Based upon current market conditions, the bonds would have a rate of 9%. However, the bonds will be priced at the time of offering. The financing will be structured based upon 30 years amortization with a 15-year call provision. This firm commitment is not conditioned on obtaining a credit enhancement such as a letter of credit. In addition to the above, the following should be noted. One, all necessary due diligence with respect to the development has been conducted. Two, an offering memorandum will be issued within 90 days of the award of the Urban Development Action Grant. Three, Payne Weber is a member of the National Association of Securities Dealers. Four, Payne Weber has reviewed the above captioned development for its credit worthiness, its compliance with certain federal laws and regulations, and its compliance with certain state laws and regulations. We have not found any circumstance which would prevent the marketing of the bonds. In addition, any legal conditions which might prohibit the issuance of the bonds will be satisfied. The undersigned has the authority to issue this commitment on behalf of Wayne Payne Weber. Very sincerely yours, Lance H. Wilson, first uh, vice president. And there is a handwritten notation accept, accepted by what I presume is Leonard Briscoe. Um, this uh, letter, on the basis of what you are telling us, Mr. Gilliam, is a fraudulent letter. It was, a letter that, it was a fraudulent letter from the point whereby we knew that they were not going to follow through with the commitment. It was a mechanism that we created to get past the 15th deadline in which for fi firm financial commitments would do. So this was not a bona fide firm financial commitment? This was not a bona fide firm financial commitment, no, sir. Now, I understand that uh, subsequently the Bell Glade Urban Development Action Grant project was below the cutoff line for that round of UDAC funding. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. What did Secretary Pierce do, and what specifically did uh, Mr. Pierce say to you in this connection? What happened on the Bell Glade housing project, uh, Bell Glade, Florida, did not do well as far as com competitiveness in the UDAC program. They were far down on the list, given the level of funding that we had left for the remainder of the year. I informed Lance that based upon where the project stood on the list at that time, that we would have, you would have to call the secretary to encourage him or ask him to reach your project. Subsequently, I went and met with the secretary prior to us going into the conference room to meet with other staff members. We went over the final list of UDAC projects. I indicated to him, have you received a call from Lance? He said, yes. I said, this is Lance's project right here, the Belgley project. He indicated to me, well, I don't like Leonard Briscoe. He said, Leonard Briscoe was a crook and he was greedy. He said, you tell Lance this is it, no more. And the secretary agreed at that point to make the cutoff Belgley, Florida. Let me be sure I understand you. Um, the secretary called 
the principal in the project, Mr. Briscoe, a crook, and he called him greedy, and he didn't like him. But because Lance Wilson intervened on behalf of the project, he agreed to, as it were, break the rules, go down until in the rank order you hit this project and agreed to fund it. That's correct. According to the March 87 funding list, and I am sending you a copy, Belglade is not the last project before the cutoff line, but the next to the last one. Why was that? <coughs> Mr. Chairman, the reason that the, the additional project was added at that time, uh, prior to my going upstairs to see the secretary, the director of the UDAC program had indicated to me that uh, he was concerned about the program becoming political. And he was concerned about his staff morale and viewing it that way. So I listened to his comments. And following my meeting with the secretary, <coughs> in which we agreed to cut off Bill Glitch as a final project, I took it upon myself to lower the line, to add the additional project so that there would not be this perception that we reached down and funded Bell Glade, Florida for Lance Wilson. The staff was getting uh, restless and demoralized, and this was really a device to sort of mislead them a bit or try to mislead them a bit. Would that be a fair statement? To try to mislead them, and also I felt that maybe w some of the staff people might dial the hotline of the Inspector General. So what I did was to make it seem that there was no favoritism. I moved it down the line and made it very clear that we didn't only reach Belgrade, but we reached other projects as well. I understand. I would like to show you another firm financial commitment letter from Lance Wis Wilson on behalf, allegedly, of Payne Weber. This one is dated November 25, 1986. It relates to another UDAG project, Overton Ridge, and it is a firm commitment for uh, some $79 million. Uh, <clears throat> the letter, in essence, is uh, very similar to the one I just read. It's on Payne Weber Stationery, dated November 25, 1986, to you as Deputy Assistant Secretary and it purports to be a firm financial commitment in the amount of $79,860,000. Was this also a, uh, another Briscoe-Wilson-UDAC project? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Payne Weber officials, as well as uh, Mr. Wilson's former supervisor at Payne Weber, gentleman by the name of Lee Barber, in interviews with subcommittee staff, stated that Mr. Wilson was never authorized to make such financial commitments on behalf of Payne Weber. Wasn't this the same scam that Wilson had used with respect to the Bell Garden project? Yes, Mr. Chairman. We used this me mechanism because at that point, at that time, as you well know, <coughs> the southwest part of the United States especially Texas, was suffering from an oil, from a decline in their economy Yes, because of the oil prices. We knew the housing market was soft. We had discontinued all FHA insurance in that region of the country. I indicated to Lance that it would be very difficult for us to get a, receive a firm financial commitment for this project given the softness of that market and the question of that market given the present economy in that area. So once again, we decided to draft a, a letter of this type to get the project past the 15th deadline. And once the project was funded, at a later date, hopefully the economy will recover some or would allow the developer to obtain uh, permanent financing to replace the Payne Weber uh, firm financial commitment notice. 
I understand, Mr. Wilson, that a career, uh, Ms. Mr. Gilliam, that a career HUD employee, Mr. David Sowell, was suspicious of this whole project. And he challenged what he believed was a fraudulent commitment letter submitted by Lance Wilson. Can you describe that sequence of events for us? Yes, Mr. Chairman. It was a situation whereby David Sal uh, came to me, he and the underwriter of this project by the name of Art Kant, and indicated <coughs> that they had concerns about the firm financial commitment letter, <coughs> that adequate due diligence had not been done on the project. Mr. Sal proceeded to contact a person he knew with the Payne Weber Venture Capitalist Group out of Boston, Massachusetts. They, in turn, contacted the people in New York, the Boston group did, to ask, did Lance, Lance Wilson have the authority to commit Payne Weber for this large amount of money? The response was yes, from New York to Boston and back to the uh, local central office. Stanley Newman came down to my office and told me that David Sal had phoned a person he knew at the Payne Weber Venture Capitalist Group in Boston, and that uh, they were going to make some phone calls. I told Stanley, thank you, I would handle it from this point. I proceeded to contact Lance to inform Lance that Sal had made a phone call trying to check out his ability to commit this much money. And did he have that authority? Lance indicated he did. I, in turn, told Lance, well, I want you to cover your back, so be aware of it. He said, I'll handle it from here. I then went upstairs and saw Deborah Dean and Secretary Pierce. And I informed the secretary <coughs> that Sal had jeopardized Lance's career and future with Payne Weber through making calls on his authorization ability to commit $79 million. I told the secretary and Deborah that it was imperative that we move Sal before he dials the 800 number. And by the 800 number in, in our political circles, that means the IG hotline. So therefore, we agreed that we should move Sal. We would have worked with Tim Quo, who at that time was Deputy Undersecretary for Field Operations, to find a spot for Sal. We, were very, we failed in trying to find any area office that we could place him in. It was resistant. So therefore, I transferred Davis out down to my office and where he sat for the remainder of my time at the agency. This is a very important matter, and I'd like to explore this a bit further. A HUD career employee, Mr. Sowell, got suspicious of a financial commitment allegedly coming in from Payne Weber, but in point of fact, without Payne Weber's approval. It was a Lance Wilson private uh, venture. And when Sowell got suspicious and uh, expressed this concern, you, in a sense, tipped off Lance Wilson, indicating that there is trouble brewing and he'd better try to cover himself. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Um, when you went to see Mr. Pierce and you told him that uh, a hot career employee is about to advise the Inspector General of suspected fraud, what did Mr. Pierce say to you? I just, I just informed the Secretary that I felt David Sal was troubled. This is not the first time we'd had trouble with Sal, and I was concerned about him calling the hotline all the time because I knew he was doing it. When you say trouble, you mean he was honest. The trouble was that he was honest. He was correct in his assessment. I'm sorry? He was correct in his assessment. Okay. What did Mr. Pierce say to you about Sal? He agreed with me that we should move him. Can you specifically tell us what he said to you? What I said, I said, Mr. Secretary, we need to move him. He says, we sh we, we, I want you to move him. I want you to work with Tim Coyle, who was a deputy undersecretary of field operations. And by field operations, he was responsible for the field <coughs> area <coughs> personnel. We were to place Sal out in the field. 
but Coyle would not cooperate with us on moving Sal out to the field. So that's when I detailed Sal down to my immediate staff as a special assistant. Well, we have had over 30 hearings concerning the scandal at HUD, but in some ways we have hit what I think is probably the single most sickening aspect of this gigantic scandal. What you are telling us under oath, uh, <coughs> Mr. Gilliam, is that an honest HUD career employee smelled crookedness, phoniness, fraudulent financial commitment submitted to HUD by a former high-ranking HUD official now working for Payne Weber. And he tried to stop that fraud. And when you advised the secretary of Housing and Urban Development that an honest HUD career employee was about to blow the whistle on another scandal, the secretary wanted him physically transferred out of Washington to the field, but since there was no immediately available position in the field, he was, as it were, parked in your office, so he would not be able to detect similar fraudulent schemes. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Would it be reasonable to expect that a secretary of a major cabinet department, when he finds that a career employee is about to uncover fraud, would assist him in this effort, would commend him for this effort, would praise him for this effort, and perhaps would promote him for this effort, rather than trying to get rid of him. Is that a reasonable conclusion? In hindsight, it is. In hindsight. Well, I think it was reasonable at the time also, uh, but uh, it certainly is not what uh, Mr. Pierce did. Was anyone else at the meeting with Mr. Pierce when getting rid of uh, Mr. Sowell was discussed. Deborah Dean. Deborah Dean was also present. She was present at the meeting. May I ask, Mr. Gilliam, was it only the three of you who were at that meeting? There's only three of us at that meeting. Secretary Pierce, his executive assistant, Deborah Dean, and yourself. Correct. And the reason we, were, we did it that way is because we had to plan a strategy because David, we knew David had worked very closely with staff members <coughs> on the Hill. So we had to plan a strategy on responding to letters from any congressional members about why David Sal was moved. So what we decided to do was to put Sal over as an advisor in the Indian Block Grant Program, which at that time had a $28 million budget. So the response was going to be that we agreed with him that Sal was a good <coughs> underwriter, a good HUD employee, we thought so much of him that we moved him in this capacity. That was the response, and that was the strategy. Did Deborah Dean express any views during the course of this meeting? She, uh, Deborah Dean, during the time of this meeting, agreed with the secretary that David had been a problem, but I was doing most of the talking. Me and the secretary were doing most of the talking, secretary and I. And the decision was? Whose decision? It had to be the secretary's decision because I knew that David's first move would be to contact the staff members on the Hill. Well, let me move on to another item. There was an urban development action grant uh, project in Florida called Riviera Beach. Uh, was Leonard Briscoe the developer and Lance Wilson, a partner in the Riviera Beach project? Yes, Mr. Chairman. 
Is it accurate to say, Ms. Gilliam, that um, the summer of 85 you had dinner with uh, Mr. Wilson at the primary restaurant? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Did Mr. Wilson at that time mention the Riviera Beach project to you? Yes, he indicated to me that he was working with a developer by the name of Leonard Briscoe out of Fort Worth, Texas. That they were trying to get a project going out of uh, Riviera Beach, Florida, which is in West Palm Beach County, Florida. Were you ready to assist at that time, Mr. Wilson, on the Riviera Beach project? I was prepared to, I left that dinner leaving with Lance the confidence that I would work very closely in getting this project done. Did you subsequently have a meeting with Mr. Briscoe at HUD about financing the Riviera Beach project? Yes, I did. What, what happened was Riviera Beach, Florida is located, <coughs> as I indicated earlier, is located in West Palm Beach, Florida. Yes. The first time the application came through for this housing project, it was under the submission name of West Palm Beach County. Uh, West Palm Beach County does not do well in a UDAG uh, minimum standard. So therefore, what we did was we made Riviera Beach what is known as a pocket of poverty instead of a <coughs> being under the umbrella of West Palm Beach County. In developing it as a pocket of poverty, we then were able to work better with trying to achieve our goal of getting the project funded. Mr. Briscoe came to my office in uh, November of 1985, after November 15, doing our PRPs, project review panel, to discuss with me the terms of his particular uh, UDAG grant application. He ran a difficulty with David Sal, who was trying to encourage him to put more equity in the project. Sal had a question about market conditions. David Sal had questions about the uh, the benefits going to the people in the pocket, and David Sal also had questions about the repayment terms. At that point in time, I intervened and sat down and took over the project, worked up some different numbers for Mr. Briscoe, and indicated to him to take these terms now, <coughs> after we get the project approved, <coughs> which would be a pocket of poverty, then come back in for an amendment, <coughs> and we'll change it around to make a more favorable terms for you. Why did you tell Mr. Briscoe that you would give him a better deal, more favorable terms at a later date? Because at that time I was trying to get the project done because of Lance Wilson's involvement. After the firm <coughs> financial commitment meeting, did you and Mr. Briscoe go for a ride in your car? Me and Mr. Briscoe went for a ride in my car. Mr. Briscoe asked me, was there anything I could do for you? I told Mr. Briscoe, yes, I want you to hire a lawyer out of Omaha, Nebraska, who was my, at that time my counsel by the name of David Steyer, who was a tax attorney. Hire him as a tax advisor, that he would be charging you $50,000 for the fees in that project on doing tax uh, analysis. And that figure later increased to $100,000. Mr. Briscoe paid a Nebraska lawyer $100,000 and uh, your expectation was that you would get some of that money? Yes, Mr. Chairman. My, my anticipation was I would participate in, that, in those funds after I left government. And at that time, the attorney, uh, David, advised me that uh, gives a bad move. He said we may run into some problems on ethical issues, and he refused to do it and participate at that time. <coughs> so he received the 100000 but refuse to pay you any part of it. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> In uh, Congressman Shays. No, sir. <laughs> Mr. Gilliam, can you describe in some detail your relationship financial and otherwise with uh, Leonard Briscoe. How much did Mr. Briscoe give you in terms of cash or clothing or travel or other items? Well, during my time at the agency, um, I established a, a line of credit with Mr. Briscoe's travel agency in Fort Worth, Texas, which I used to pay for trips for my family members. I also received uh, 
clothing for me and my family from Mr. Briscoe. And throughout my time at HUD, I received cash payments from Mr. Briscoe, uh, not to exceed, at that time, $5,000. And following my uh, departure from HUD, at a later date, I became a consultant in Mr. Briscoe's organization. Now, without uh, getting into substantive criminal law, I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Chase. He, he was given the amounts, and then you said consultant. How much did you receive from Mr. Briscoe? Mm -hmm. On a consulting basis, I received from Mr. Briscoe during my time with the company somewhere between <coughs> thirty to forty thousand dollars. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Ms. Gilliam. Without getting into substantive criminal law, whether this was bribery or illegal gratuities or whatever, which is a job better left to the Justice Department, is it reasonable to assume that? Mr. Briscoe, who had projects before HUD, expected something in return for all these favors? Yes, Mr. Chairman. He expected to have access to me and to be able to work out his projects, in which I did. Work out the projects on a preferential basis, would you say? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And after you left HUD in September 87, as you indicated, uh, you went to work for Leonard Briscoe as a consultant. Yes, I did. For about how long? I was with Mr. Briscoe for just under a year. We worked as a consultant on trying to do some housing projects in the northeastern part of the United States. Did Mr. Briscoe strike you as the type of a guy who takes care of people at HUD who help him either during or after they leave HUD? Yes, Mr. Chairman, he did. I saw what had happened with uh, Lance, and so I decided to uh, look at it as an opportunity after governor. I'd like to shift our attention to another UDAC grant, this time given to the Hampton Institute. What was Secretary Pierce's relationship uh, with the Hampton Institute? Well, at that time, Mr. Pierce was serving on the Board of Trustees of Hampton uh, Institute. And he contacted me down in my office and informed me that he had in his office the president of Hampton Institute as well as a staff member with the president, Dr. Thomas Harvey. He indicated that he wanted me to work with Hampton Institute and get their project funded on the fundable list for an upcoming UDAG round, which would be a, at a later time. I met with the staff person from, who was with Mr. Harvey, indicated to him that I would be down to Hampton University to visit the site <coughs> personally to see what we could do to make this project <coughs> uh, go. I called up Lance Wilson. Before, before you go down to the, to the issue of your visit uh, to the Institute, I'd like to clarify a point, if I may. Did Secretary Pierce tell you <coughs> to assist Hampton, or did he tell you to fund the project? He told me both. He told me he wanted me to assist him, and he wanted to fund it. That was a statement made to me. <coughs> I informed him that I would work with him personally to make certain that there were no problems on that application. That was the reason I took the trip down to Hampton to take a look at the project, visit with city officials indicating our interest in the project. I took with me two people, Roy Priest from the UDAG staff. I felt it was better suited that Roy work with the president and universities as the black institution. Secondly, I had Lance Wilson go with me on the trip because I wanted to provide Lance with some additional business opportunities. We made the trip down to Hampton Institute. We were greeted by the area manager of the Richmond office. We went over to the university and met with the president. We were there for about an hour where they outlined to us what they wanted to do and et cetera. And then I informed, I informed the president of the university at that time that we had to leave. And the president told me that you, not, you haven't been here that long. I said, well, we have a flight to catch. He says, well, do you want me to call the secretary? And I told him, no, you don't have to do that. We'll change our flight reservations. And we stayed there, visited the site, went over the project proposal again, had lunch with him, and we spent the entire day and left later that evening. Congressman Schumer. Clarify a point. In other <laughs> words, Secretary Pierce told you he wanted the project funded before they had even submitted an application. 
Yes, they needed some work. They didn't have the technical expertise to do the project. So there they was no application, just a visit to his office, and he said fund it before you knew anything about the financial details or anything else in the project. Said he wanted it funded. Thank you. Tell us about uh, HUD General Counsel Dorsey's opinion that Mr. Pierce could not be involved in the decision-making process with respect to Hampton because of his relationship to the college? Mr. Chairman, the, the Hampton uh, project was funded in the September round in 1987. I left on September 9th of 1987. But the project itself has already way down the road before I left. Before I left, I left two projects with the staff that were given priority and emphasis that things I wanted done that were important to the secretary. And one of them was Hampton Institute. The general counsel, my understanding, at a later date indicated that the secretary did not play an active role or would remove himself from that funding round, in which at that time the undersecretary replaced him in making the, uh, the, the cutoffs on the list, on the UDAC list for that September round. But the project was way down the road at that time because when I looked at the project, I had two questions. At that time, Hampton Institute had a very large endowment fund of close to $60 million. Secondly, I questioned the pocket of poverty, the proximity of the site they wanted to use for the development. But those things were all worked out, and the project subsequently was funded in September of 1987. Is there any doubt in your mind that but for Secretary Pierce's order that the project be funded, it would not have been funded? If that had been a project from, without the Secretary's involvement, the staff would have recommended to me a but for policy question on the fact that the university has such a large endowment and the cost of the project was just over $10 million and they probably would argue the point that they could put more equity into it because the land was already paid off and it was uh, just a matter of developing it or putting up a mortgage against it. I'd like to focus on the UDAC selection process and this movable cutoff line that I referred to earlier as uh, the reach down and help someone approach. <coughs> On the list of UDAG's eligible projects to be funded, that list was given to Mr. Pierce. Who wrote the names on Mr. Pierce's copy indicating who was behind each project? Deborah Dean. What we would do is I would run off a draft list following our PRP session. I would take two copies upstairs, one was for Deborah and one for the secretary. At that time, we would begin to go over the list as to who's backing the project. We would then take the list. She would have her copy, I'd have my copy, and the secretary would have his. Let's say that we were going to make a funding decision on Friday that week. The secretary would receive his copy, on a draft copy, on Thursday morning. I would come in on Friday morning with a final list, with a final list that we were going to make our determination off of. I would go over the list once again with the secretary. He had his list, I had mine, which he was referring to who was supporting what projects. I would, he asked me then to leave out of the room. I would leave out, and then I noticed when I was sitting on the couch, the phone light went on. I came back in. He indicated to me we were going to cut it off at this point. The secretary always had to consult with OMB prior to making any decisions <coughs> on cutoff points on the UDAC list because of the fact it was a program in which they had opposed and wanted zeroed out since the Reagan, during the Reagan years. So to the best of your knowledge, <coughs> the <coughs> the UDAG list went to OMB and to the White House. The UDAG list did go to OMB and to the White House. To whom? The UDAG list, the UDAG list would have went over to, to the, on the OMB side, would have went to the director, the deputy director, and to the associate director at that time would have been Carol Crawford, as well as her staff, people would have saw a copy of the list.
You're testifying, Ms. Gilliam, that Mr. Pierce discussed this list and the movable cutoff line with the OMB. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Was it common for consultants to have copies of the list without the names of individuals before the official meeting? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Which consultants did you give a copy of the list to? I gave copies to a consultant by the name of Mike Karam and another consultant by the name of Richard Shelby. Anybody else? Those are the only names I gave copies to. Did Bill Taylor get copies? He got one copy on one occasion. My apologies. <sighs> Now, in 1987, you had an extraordinary experience with UDAG in connection with an Albuquerque project, which was announced before HUD was aware that it had been funded. Uh, can you tell us how this announcement uh, came about? Yes, sir. This project was a, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which was a pocket of poverty. It was a mixed-use project. A day a day, two days before we were going to sit down and make uh, a determination on what projects we're going to fund, I received a phone call from Alan Ryan Smith from the Office of Management and Budget. He informed me that he had tried to reach the secretary, had, OMB had tried to reach the secretary's office in Deborah Dean and they were out. So therefore he was calling me to inform me that OMB was funding the Albuquerque project. So I said, what Albuquerque project? So was, was that the first time you heard about it? That was the first time I heard about it at that time. So then I summoned down the UDAG reviewer. I says, what about this Albuquerque project? Can you brief me on it? They indicated to me there may be problems. I said, thank you, leave. The person left. I subsequently found out what had occurred was is that representatives from Albu Albuquerque had visited with the UDAG staff and had learned about there were problems. They then, which they have the right to do, went and saw their congressional representative, Senator Domenici. Senator Domenici then spoke with, Senate, at that time, former Senator Howard Baker, who was chief of staff to the president, and indicated that they needed the project funded. He informed him that the project would be funded, and that's what triggered the phone calls that subsequently came down to me and informed me that the project was going to be funded. I, in turn, contacted Ms. Dean's secretary and said, I need to locate Deborah immediately. Deborah called me up. I explained to her about this phone call. She said, come on upstairs. We're going to call OMB right now. I went upstairs. I saw Deborah Dean. She got on the phone first to Alan Ryan Smith, who indicated, Ryan Quist, excuse me, who indicated that he and Deborah were arguing back and forth. It wasn't his call. She, in turn, called Carol Crawford, and they got to arguing. Deborah says, OMB cannot make the announcements on UDAGs. We haven't even done due diligence on this project yet. And Deborah indicated to me that Mrs. Crawford's response was, we're OMB, we can do what we want to do. But subsequently, the project got funded. I had to go back downstairs, sit down with the UDAG reviewers, and go over it. We got the project in shape, it met the qualifications, and subsequently it was, found, it was funded. It was the first one on the list in 1987, the March of 1987 round. Carol Crawford told Deborah Dean, we can do whatever we want and uh, we can fund it. For OMB. At that OMB. was a statement Deborah told me that was made to her. Mm -hmm. And I, went I, had to, I had to go back downstairs because I had to make certain there was no problems with the UDAG. And subsequently, they got the project. They got the project approved. It was funded. And to my understanding, the project is a success and it's up and going. I'd like to talk to you about uh, some Florida UDAG applications, such as the two for Overton, both funded in July 86. Why was it so important that these projects be funded? Well, at that time, uh, former Senator Paul Hawkins uh, needed those projects in that area of the country because she was running behind her opponent. Uh, she needed to boost some strong, she needed strong showings in Miami. Uh, her staff had visited with me. She herself had visited with the secretary, and it was very important that we reached those two projects, and subsequently we did reach those two projects located in Overtown, which is in Miami, Florida. 
Would these projects have been funded under normal circumstances? Under normal circumstances, they would, they would not have been funded unless we would have spent a large amount of money in a given round because Miami, Florida just does not do well in the UDAC program because they do not have an older housing stock in that part of the country. An urban development action grant was funded to build a parking garage for a hotel in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Mr. Karam, whom you indicated earlier, was involved in this project. I understand that this UDAG was not on the first funding list, but it magically appeared on the final funding list. How did that happen, Mr. Gilliam? What happened was there was a question on the size of the UDAG. Uh, Michael indicated he needed over $2 million for the parking garage. David Sal felt they needed a lesser amount. So David's recommendation to me was it become what is known in our circles as a fundable holdover. A project that, um, that has the potential of being funded was going to be held over until the repayment terms could be worked out. I informed David Sal, that Dave, not David Sal, but Michael Karam, that Mike, this project's in trouble. I don't what know. was Michael Karam doing at the time? Michael Karam was a HUD consultant. In private time. business. In private business. Mm -hmm. I informed Michael, I don't know if I could save this one. You know, you better make some calls. Michael indicated to me that he was going to call Crawford at OMB and try to get the project back on the list because I did not put it on the first draft list. Now, I don't know who Michael called, but a short time later, I got a call from Deborah indicating to me uh, what's the status of the Birmingham project. I informed her. She said, see if you could work it out. I subsequently asked Sal to come down to my office. And I told him I wanted it worked out. And I want it worked out this level and with these terms. And that project was put on the, the final list, and it made, that, made it that round. Would it be reasonable to assume that Mr. Karam, the private consultant, called Ms. Crawford, as he said he would at OMB, who in turn called Deborah Dean? He called someone, Mr. Chairman. I'm going by a statement that he made to me. But he called someone, and Deborah called me, and I made certain that project was on the list. He told you that he's going to call Crawford? Yes. Right. wonder, Ms. Gilliam, if you could tell us about the Nashville Convention Center issue. That was a project down in Nashville, Tennessee, in which uh, a Mr. Joe Rogers, who was the finance chairman <coughs> for President Reagan's uh, election committee in 1980. Uh, what occurred there was there had been a, that grant had been approved, and what we call the grant agreement documents had been laying around. I got a call from the secretary uh, inquiring as to the whereabouts of that UDAG grant agreement, and he instructed me that he wanted that grant agreement moved out of there and signed immediately. At that time, I did not have responsibility for the UDAG program. I did locate the grant agreement, signed it, and that grant agreement was moved out of the UDAG central office and forwarded to the uh, local jurisdiction. You did that upon a direct uh, demand by the secretary? Yes, Mr. Chairman. even though at that time you were not responsible for UDAG projects. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Would it be fair to infer that the secretary called you because he trusted you and he knew you could get things done? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask you about a UDAG project uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, this project got into some problems on firm financial commitments. You called the secretary to tell him about it. Can you explain a bit about this? There's a project <coughs> located in Massachusetts in the district of uh, former Congressman Eddie Bolin, whereby there was a problem with what we call at that time a bond opinion. On the 15th of each month, in addition to a firm financial commitment that was due, all other commitments that were required as a part of the project had to be doing as well, i.e., if you at that time were using tax-exempt bonds, we needed to have the inducement resolution from the issuing authority. We also needed at that time bond opinion letters from the proper general counsel indicating those bonds were tax 
free bonds that met all the IRS requirements. At that time, that project lacked the bond opinion. We instead, on an informant secretary, that the bond opinion was not in. He indicated to me, I need to get that project done. I don't want to call back Bowling and tell him I can't do it. I told him I'd call him back. I began to sit down and meet with Stanley Newman, David Sal. We proceeded to have a meeting with John Knapp, Bob Kennison, myself, Stanley Newman, and David Sal. At that meeting, we went over the issues surrounding that firm, that part of the firm financial commitment not being in as of 6 p.m. I asked Bob Kinnison, David Stile, Stanley Newman to step outside the door, in which they did. I then in turn informed John Knapp that the secretary needed this project. I thought it would be in our best interest to use the inducement resolution and the opinion from the state issuing authority because they indicated in their issuing authority that these were tax free bonds, any interest earned on these bonds would be non-taxable. And I felt that was sufficient enough to accept and move forward on the project. John Knapp agreed that we could work up such an opinion. I then told him to hold the other members here while I go down the hallway and speak with the secretary to inform him we had worked out this project. He in turn contacted former Congressman Eddie Bolin and told him that that project would be on the list and it would get funded. Tell us about the Cleveland uh, project concerning the restoration of Playhouse Square. Why was uh, UDAG awarded there? The UDAG, this particular UDAG uh, project involved some tax exempt bonds as well. At that time, uh, these bonds had been closed upon and done in what is we call pre sold bonds. Whenever you do a escrow closing on bonds or do a pre sale of these bonds at that time, it was our policy that the trustee issue a statement to HUD before the 15th date that without the UDAG, that the proceeds or the escrows, the, the project would not go forward and the bonds would be returned or the, the investors' funds would be returned. At that particular time, there was a mayor from Cleveland, Ohio by the name of George, Vin George Vornovich, who was a major player in the Republican Party politics and he wanted his project done. And so therefore, we got an opinion from John Knapp that we could, we could, although we did not have the firm financial commitment uh, in, by that time, the part dealing with if but for the UDAC, this bond closure were not complete, John Knapp gave us a waiver, and we used other terminology in the place of it. And that project went forward and was subsequently successful in being funded. Mr. Gilliam. Besides Mr. Briscoe, Lance Wilson, Mr. Karam, did you receive any gratuities in connection with any other UDAC projects? Yes, I did, Mr. Chairman. Can I you tell us about those? I received gratuities from a developer out of Cleveland, Ohio, by the name of Robert Thompson, who was the president at that time of Tom Robb Construction Company. Mr. Thompson was involved in a UDAC project called Sandy Acres that was located in Lorraine, Ohio. I received payments from him while at the agency, not only related to that particular UDAC project, but also a HODAC project, as well as a special projects grant, and also referring him bond business from potential uh, bond underwriting business. And then the amount of money that I received for those things that I did for, the, for that particular developer were $34,000 while at the agency. In 1986, <coughs> a UDAG application had been submitted for a project in New Haven, Connecticut. Congressman Morrison, whose district includes New Haven, asked for a meeting with HUD officials to work out some problems with the application. <laughs> Ms. Dean told you to set up a big meeting and to work out that project. Why did Ms. Dean tell you to do that? Well, at the time, Ms. Dean stated to me she wanted to have a meeting because she thought that the congressman was cute, that we should have the meeting. We had the meeting. Uh, Fred Brown, prior to calling the meeting, a consultant by the name of Fred Brown 
who was a major player in Republican politics, contacted her after you he heard about the meeting and indicated that he wanted the representative from his office to be in attendance at the meeting. She agreed. We had the meeting in the Secretary's conference room. Myself, Deborah, David Sow, representatives from the city of New Haven, representatives of the developer, Congressman Morrison was there along with his staff, Lowell Swikert, uh, former Senator Swikert's staff was there as well, and also uh, Mr. Dodd's staff was there. We went over the project, we found out what some of the problems were in the project. We asked the city staff people to please excuse us for a moment. We asked, me and Deborah asked David Sow to step outside into the secretary's main sitting area. The secretary was not in that day. We asked David Sow what was wrong with the project. Sow pointed out some issues. I interfered with the conversation and told Sal, let's cut to the chase. I want you to go back in that room. I want you to tell the city officials you've changed your mind and you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna work with them on funding this project. I want you to do it, either you do it or I'm gonna do it. Sal indicated that he would go back in and recommend to them that they go downstairs and work out whatever, whatever concerns that they had. We went back in the room, Deborah took her place at the head table and we indicated to them that David had something to say. David Sal said, I'd like to work out this UDAG with the city of New Haven. Why don't we move this meeting downstairs and let's go over some technical issues and hammer it out. They, then they did. I told Sal to report to me immediately as, far as, he, as soon as he had those problems ironed out. The project was subsequently placed on the list and was funded. And also what happened on that project was that a news report came out in New Haven, Connecticut that that Du Bois Gilliam would not approve that project unless the city of New Haven paid Fred Brown $50,000. The city did pay Fred Brown $50,000. I didn't receive any of that money, nor did I indicate to city officials that I would not approve that project without Fred Brown's involvement. Is it your testimony that basically it was the good looks of Congressman Morrison which accounted for the funding of this project? That was a different experience for me, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I can't answer that question. <laughs> different experience. You described uh, HUD in your many interviews with subcommittee staff as a political agency where nothing was done based on need. Is this still your view of the agency during the period that you served there, Mr. Gilliam? Well, during the period I was I served there, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be quite frank with you that uh, the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development was the best domestic political machine I've ever seen. And we dealt strictly politics. And that may not have been the way we should have operated in hindsight, but that is the way we operated off of very limited resources. Well, I want to thank you very much, Ms. Gilliam, and I'll turn the questioning over to my friend and colleague, uh, Congressman Kyle. I think before we move to Congressman Kyle, uh, I would like to express my strong appreciation to uh, Celia Boddington of the subcommittee staff and Stuart Weisberg, the subcommittee staff director, who uh, did the bulk of the work, uh, but I also want to express my appreciation to all members of the subcommittee in preparing these three hearings. And before we turn to Congressman Kyle, perhaps we will take a five-minute recess. Gilliam, uh, you said something at the beginning of your testimony that I'd like to clarify regarding Secretary Pierce's role. You indicated that you had to clear through Pierce any discretionary fund allocations. You specifically mentioned Section 8, uh, mod rehab, and some other things, but I didn't hear you specifically mention UDAG. Was that just an oversight? Yes, yeah, oversight. We did have to clear UDAG through the Secretary. I'm, I'm sorry? That was an oversight. We did have to clear it through the Secretary. UDAG Thank you. Program. <coughs> you testified regarding uh, helping uh, applicants get their projects in shape and suggesting to them, for example, that they um, structure their loans in such a way that they had a zero interest during the first uh, period of time and then have a balloon payment at the end. And 
that uh, they might suggest uh, when it came time to make the balloon payment to the city officials that they were going to walk uh, and that uh, if the city wanted the project to go forward, then the city would have to pick up the money. Is that correct? The city would forgive the note, the loan, the repayment well, loan. Uh, and then that's uh, just so that what would happen is the city, instead of ha was how the UDAG program was intended to work, how it was encouraged to work, was that these UDAG monies would become a revolving loan basis. And in essence, instead of the city receiving back monies to reinvest in other low-income activity, they receive no money back because the developer uh, would keep it as just a direct grant. How often uh, was that done to your knowledge? I've read about now at the Inspector General's office where I did a lot of closeout audits on a good project, a number of projects. 85 and 86, they would find that to be a very common practice. A very common practice? Very common practice. Can you give us an order of magnitude number of projects that might have been funded in that way? I mean, are we talking tens or scores or well, hundreds? Well, I feel like this. During my time at the agency, during my time at the agency, the total uh, that I had direct responsibility for from 1985 to 1987 in the UDAG program, I had the responsibility of uh, spending over $1 billion of UDAG funds. And we generated $8 billion in private investments. So what I'm saying is that uh, I know for a fact in excess of 20 percent of those monies or situations whereby at some point in time developers are going to be approaching local jurisdictions and indicating to them uh, the inability to pay the UDAC grant and therefore needing some restructuring of that loan to become a direct grant or get a longer period in which to pay it back. You were in charge of this for about three years, is that correct? I was in charge of the program from July of 1985 until September of 1987. And during that time, then, your testimony is that somewhere on the order of 20 percent of the approximately billion dollars of federal money was forgiven uh, under this scheme that you identified. Would have been, will be, or have been forgiven. Was because this? We had a common practice, excuse me for cutting you off. We, we got inundated. This is one of the complaints of the staff. We had so many amendments, and even the Inspector General questioned the fact that we had so many amendments. They can never attribute to it as why. Why are there so many amendments? You always want to indicate that market, market conditions changed since the UDAG award occurred itself. But in fact, it was a pre-planned uh, uh, program from the beginning in many of these cases. Yes, that's correct, Mr. Kyle. Um, how did you come about to, to give this advice? Did uh, Deborah Dean or Sam Pierce or somebody else suggest to you that this was something you should do? No, I did it on my own because of the fact that you know, you have to realize when you're, when you have 60 days to look at $400 million worth of projects and reduce that down to a fundable list of $150 million, and then you only have $70, $80 million to spend, and you getting pressure from calls from different people to work out this project and that project, that wasn't enough time. So therefore, I had to buy time. In order to buy that time, you work out amendment processes, come back in a later date for amendments, take this deal for now, and return at a later date, and we could rework the structuring or financing of that project. So this was basically your idea of how to resolve that, that time pressure problem. That is correct, sir. Uh, now, you indicated that Secretary Pierce told you to fund two projects, Hampton, Virginia, and uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Those were the only two that he specifically told you to fund. Is that correct? Those are the only two that he had that direct statement to me on, on the UDAG program. But you got to realize, when we were in the UDAG rounds, you would get phone calls from political consultants. You would receive phone calls from congressional members pressuring us to reach their projects on the list. And so therefore, we would have to sit down and go over that list of who we wanted to help and who we didn't want to help. So it wasn't just Secretary Pierce that applied pressure. It was members of Congress and consultants as well. And you had specifically relations, uh, relationships with certain consultants that you sort of had an ongoing uh, relationship with. That's correct, Mr. Sir. Yes, correct. Uh, one of those was Lance Wilson, for example. That's correct. Yes, sir. Was that relationship developed uh, personally through the two of you, or, or uh, did Secretary Pierce or Deborah Dean um, in effect force that relationship? No, they, did not, they didn't force that relationship. We developed a relationship because when I arrived there in April of 1984, Lance was still the executive assistant. Lance did not leave until June of 84. 
But uh, as time went on, we became closer, and I realized that how close he and the secretary were as well. Uh, Lance Wilson's uh, projects were given some uh, preference not only because you were close to him, but also because the secretary was close That's to him. That's correct, yes, sir. You also indicated that there was one project that the secretary specifically uh, did not fund, and that was one on which uh, Congressman Gonzalez had made a call. Uh, to your knowledge, did uh, Secretary Pierce know enough about that project to turn it down for reasons other than the fact that Congressman Gonzalez had lobbied for it? No, sir. In other words, it, it would have only have been the fact that he had made the call. That's correct. Uh, why would Secretary Pierce turn it down in that event? The Secretary and Representative Gonzalez, um, Representative Gonzalez had made some statements about the Secretary call him a step and fetch it, a racial tone name. The secretary was very offended by it, and he basically never forgave uh, Congressman Gonzalez for that statement. You also uh, testified that you always tried to help Lance. I think those were your words. That's correct, sir. Uh, do you know about how many different projects you helped Lance Wilson on? I worked with Lance Wilson on five different UDAG projects. So there were other projects as well, but the, these are the number of UDAG projects, is that Lance correct? Lance Wilson, as far as my portfolio was concerned, Lance worked with me directly on UDAG projects. All right. Did, um, with regard to the practice of the uh, financial commitments and um, uh, fudging on those commitments, uh, I think you, you testified to two specific situations. Uh, were there others? Yeah, I'm talking about Lance Wilson now. No. Uh, how did this practice develop? This practice uh, developed as a result of the fact that I began to notice that there was a high level of, uh, of amendments from developers out of the Detroit area and Cleveland area to change financing institutions. So what I indicated to Lance was that it would be better on these type of projects that we're doing right now to get these firm financial commitments in. And so therefore, we developed a mechanism whereby that firm financial commitment would come in. There was already a pre-understanding between he and I, which the UDAC staff had no knowledge of, that um, at a later date, the developer would come in with a new uh, underwriter, a new financier. I'm still not clear on why uh, the, the practice developed. Uh, did it uh, arise out of um, um, the need to fund projects that were not good projects, but uh, projects uh, that were pressured by, by someone for HUD to approve? No, I think that in most cases, the UDAC program itself is a high-risk uh, investment uh, fund. And so therefore, most of the projects we were financing were, were had tremendous, you know, had financial gaps in them. And they were the type of projects where uh, very few lenders would go beyond a 60 or 70 percent commitment at that point in time because of a certain market condition that could exist. We even had some developers who would submit their own net worth, but they met the policy in three times the net worth. And so therefore, they used that to get by the 15th deadline until they could find a sufficient financier to back their project at a later date. So this uh, problem with financing was a problem that was uh, basically inherent in the UDAG program. Uh, it would be exacerbated if you were asked to approve a poor project, but it existed in many of the projects. Is that correct? It did not exist in many other projects. I just point out in, in some cases where the markets were soft, especially in projects that we have funded in the Southwest or the Midwest and some Eastern projects because of the declining economies in both oil and agriculture. At one point, at the time we funded those projects, they were going to go forward, but there was a period whereby when it got to closing, the market was soft or there wasn't a good day to do it, and so therefore, they had to look at alternative ways in which to finance those projects. In some cases, they were successful. In other cases, the projects uh, did not go forward and we recaptured the funds. So this uh, fudging of the financial statements uh, was a factor in, in both good projects and projects uh, on which the department received pressure to fund. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And you said it actually began uh, uh, as a way of solving the financing problems for uh, soft projects. Um, but I gather you then developed it uh, uh, to be utilized in those projects where 
uh, you had received specific pressure to apply the funding. Is that correct? Well, that's correct. Uh, on this Belglade project, uh, how did you know that the commitment was not a bona fide firm commitment? Because of my previous discussions with Lance on the project itself. So you had actually discussed this ruse with him on this specific project before he submitted the, <coughs> the letter correct. that the chairman uh, asked you about? That's correct, Mr. Kyle. Did uh, Secretary Pierce know of this practice to your knowledge? No, he did not. Did Deborah Dean know of this practice to your knowledge? No, she did not. Okay, so this was just basically your way of handling the uh, situation? Yes, sir. To your knowledge, did any other Payne Weber people know of it? No, they did not. When uh, you had the conversation with Secretary Pierce uh, in which he said, and I'm trying to paraphrase your testimony, uh, Okay, uh, I'll fund this one, uh, but I don't like Leonard Briscoe. He's a crook. And tell Lance this is it. Uh, can you uh, tell us what Secretary Pierce meant by that statement? He had been getting reports that Leonard Briscoe um, was having problems with some of his projects. He also had received some comments on the fact that they thought that uh, Mr. Briscoe may be involved, may be involved in rewarding uh, former officials that assisted him from the United States Department of HUD and local officials out of Fort Worth. So he did not have a strong comfort level with that developer. And so therefore, that's the reason he indicated to me that it informed Lance that this was it. I wasn't going to do it anymore. He, was, he, just, he just did not appreciate that developer because he had been given some, some bad reports on this developer at that time. Now, when you said uh, he's not going to do it anymore, what did you mean by that? What I meant by that was he told Lance, in other words, I'm not going to be reaching now for this type of project anymore. In other words, uh, would it be fair to say that Secretary Pierce felt that he had done Lance Wilson a lot of favors, but that uh, Wilson was making it kind of tough for him and bringing uh, people like uh, Briscoe uh, in, into the program, and as a result, the Secretary wasn't going to do any more favors for Wilson or that he wasn't going to fund any more of Briscoe's projects? He did not want to be put in a position of assisting a developer like Briscoe anymore. And I passed that on to Leonard Briscoe that uh, I thought that it was time to, to, at this point, to cool a little bit and not make any more applications for a while. Uh, did anybody else know about these uh, uh, fraudulent financing statements I except yourself, to your knowledge? David Sal and Art Kahn were suspicious about it, but they never knew. The only people knew about what was going on was myself and Lance. Was uh, Wilson the only individual that engaged in this practice? I can only tell you about dealings with me. Normally, you have to realize, Mr. Kyle, that most developers uh, or bankers would not deal with me directly. I would refer them down to deal with the staff people. But to your knowledge, the things you've testified to us today are, are the only ones that existed? Yes, correct. Uh, by the way, how do you spell David Sowell's last name? S-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Um, is there any doubt in your mind that Secretary Pierce was attempting to cover up fraud in telling you to get rid of Mr. Sowell? What happened in that case was we felt that David Sowell had went too far. We felt he did not have the authority or had no right to contact and question Lance's authority on how much money he could commit paying Weber to. We felt that David Sal would not have done that under any other circumstances but for it being some, a letter from Payne Weber that Lance Wilson signed. So what we did was we felt that Sal's motivation was to discredit Lance and cause him problems with his job. And so therefore, it was sort of like a bottom line, as you have Notice from my statements, uh, we had a lot of problems with David Sal on a lot of projects. And so I felt it was just time to move him because in some cases, Sal would, would agree to something, then he would turn around and call the hotline and complain about it, and the next morning the IG would come down and pull the file and keep it for review purposes and delay us on carrying through on our due diligence on the project. So therefore, it was just time to move Sal because of the fact that every, every time we have a UDEG round, there were just being too many problems. 
Now, let me go back to the question again. Um, you seem to indicate two different reasons why you and Secretary Pierce and Deborah Dean wanted to move David Sowell to get rid of him, in effect. Uh, one is because uh, he wanted to do damage to the ability and reputation of Mr. Wilson. The other, that um, he interfered with your operations, um, some of which were improper operations. Now, were both of those the motives that you and Secretary P Pierce had, as far as you know? They were, a part of it was my motive and the other part was his motive. My part was if I was, Sal was interfering with the way I need to operate to get projects done. Second one was Secretary Pierce and Myers together, whereby if it was trying to discredit Lance and causing problems at his job. At that time, Secretary Pierce did not know about the Payne Weber firm financial commitment letters or to the extent of what had happened behind the scenes as far as discussions between Lance and I. I'm, I'm really unclear now about your testimony. Um, I agree with the chairman that um, the most, uh, perhaps the most important thing that you've testified to this morning uh, was the suggestion that because this employee wanted to spill the beans to the inspector general, um, the secretary and you and Deborah all strategized to remove him from a position which would enable him to do that. Uh, the clear implication, if not direct assertion on your part, was that uh, the secretary knew that fraudulent activities were going on and wanted to avoid an inspector general's investigation of those, and that's why he wanted Sal moved. Uh, is that a correct interpretation of your testimony, or is it not? And perhaps uh, in the process of answering, could you restate precisely uh, what you intended and what the Secretary intended as far as you know? In my earlier statement, uh, Mr. Mr. Kyle, I indicated that I went upstairs and saw the Secretary and Deborah. I indicated to the Secretary about Sal had contacted the Payne Weber officials questioning whether Lance had the authority to issue that type of firm financial commitment for Payne Weber without doing adequate due diligence. I told the Secretary that Sal was a problem and that I thought we should move him before he calls the 800 number on the projects. A decision was made at that time to move Sal to the field and I was to work with Tim Coyle. That was my statement I made to the Secretary. Now one could interpret that as meaning that you were trying to move a government official that was trying to do his job. But at the time that we were doing, we were doing things at HUD, in hindsight, in hindsight, for appearance purposes, that, 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 is, that is what was done, basically. We moved Sal because we did not want to have any problems with him on calling the IG, and plus we did not want any more phone calls to go to Payne Weber representatives. Did the secretary know, as far as you know, that Mr. Saul was calling the IG? I told him he was calling the IG. Uh, on this particular matter or on other matters? On or other both? matters. The IG had what was called a hotline where the, a HUD official, a HUD employee, or any citizen could call in and leave a complaint. And, and I knew that Saul was calling in on certain projects that triggered the IG to come down and start looking at certain UDAG grant agreements and grant applications. So therefore, I informed the secretary that David Sow, as a part of my conversation with him, that David Sow was, in fact, contacting the IG, and we need to move him because he was trouble. From your statement to the secretary, and I recognize this is your perception, you can't necessarily get inside the secretary's mind, but from your statement to the secretary, do you believe that his statement to you that it was important to get rid of Mr. Sal was based upon his desire to protect Lance Wilson from further inquiry or to ensure that Mr. Sal didn't continue to call the IG on this matter or that he didn't continue to call the IG on other matters where he might cause trouble or all three of those things. Based upon my statement, he would have moved 
Davis South because of all three of those things. So he apparently, in your, in your view, concurred with you that he didn't want David Sowell causing any trouble, meaning raising questions about Mr. Wilson or any other matter involving HUD. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, did he ever uh, cause any other trouble, as far as you know? No, I had him sitting outside of my office. I kept eye on him at that point. Uh, the only thing that occurred to me was that he was also maybe a little closer to uh, to the point where things were happening, and uh, that mm -hmm. might have been a dangerous move, not a good move. What, what what was your view on that? I kept him traveling. You kept him traveling? Put him on the road. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Did Mr. Pierce do anything about Mr. Briscoe, as far as you know? Not at the time I had left the agency, no. Uh, in addition to um, uh, Senator Hawkins' office and uh, Senator Domenici and Representative Gonzalez, do you know of other occasions where representatives in Congress or senators uh, called you or the secretary on projects? Yes, sir. Would you elaborate? We got numerous phone calls from Senator D'Amato. We got phone calls from the two senators from Pennsylvania, Senator Specter and Hines, Strong Sermon out of South Carolina, Paula Hawkins out of Florida, out of Alabama, at that time Jeremiah Denton, out of Mississippi, Trent Lott, Thad Cochran, out of Louisiana, Henson Moore, out of California, Phil Graham. Out of California, Pete, Pete Wilson. Anybody else? Tr Grassley from Iowa. We received calls before from Senator Dole's office out of Kansas, a former Senator Percy's office out of Illinois, and numerous other phone calls across the country. We became a HUD. Department of Housing and Urban Development is the most flexible program in any executive branches programs that they have. We have the ability to where if a senator or a congressman needed a project in any given area to increase his presence or strengthen his, his uh, poll ranking in an area, we have the ability to move funds in that area very quickly. And we always receive phone calls. We have the Secretary of Discretionary Funds. We have the UDAP program. We had the 108 Loan Guarantee Program. We were very flexible in making grants available for certain projects that there was no other agency, given the time of budget cuts that were occurring, could fund. And you saw that program flexibility abused during the time you were there? I saw that, that program used for political purpose. And today, as I sit here, I would, in hindsight, I would say it was abused. And you directly participated in that yourself? Yes, sir, I did. How about members of the United States House of Representatives? The secretary was, was always trying to please Mr. Eddie Bolin, former congressman from up in Massachusetts. Um, I received pressure from Mr. Frank. Bonnie Frank came to my office on several occasions to meet with me about a UDAC project. Uh, we received phone calls from, from then Trent Lott was a congressman in Biloxi, Mississippi area. And, um, Quite naturally, congressional delegations out of Nebraska, congressional delegations out of Illinois, Chicago area, and out of the Cleveland, Ohio area. We received a large number of phone calls and letters. You have to understand, Mr. Kyle, I, have, I received 200 phone calls a day, and that kept us very, very busy in addition to uh, other program responsibilities that I had at that time in trying to keep up with everything. So I, today I I'm unable to sit here and tell you precisely what time someone called and what day, et cetera. It was just so many phone calls because we had so many, we had the most flexible programs. No, I, I'm not asking you for times and dates, <laughs> uh, and I don't expect you to remember yeah. all of the names. You, you also mentioned Dodd, Weicker, and uh, Representative Morrison, and I'm, uh, are yeah. you telling us that there were probably others as well? There, was, there were so many. It was, we, we had UDAG program, which had far reaching across the country. You had the CDBG block grant program that had our regulatory uh, problems and waivers that need to be done. You had 108 loan guarantee program. You had secretary discretionary fund programs. 
we had we had far reaching powers on determining the outcome of, of races in some jurisdictions and whether economic development project would go forward or not. And in some cases, my colleague, you oh, certainly. Just, uh, just for the record, I, I believe uh, Congressman Morrison's involvement stemmed from Deborah Dean viewing him as handsome rather than his <laughs> coming to you. Is that correct? Cute. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes, yes sir. Thank you. I thank my colleague. <laughs> well, for whatever reason, the meeting was held. Uh, he had made a contact with the office, I gather. Yes, sir. Uh, was there anything wrong with the um, project that um, was funded in Nashville, the, the one that Secretary Pierce said uh, you needed to move, and so you got the grant agreement done? No, sir. That project was completed, and my understanding is, is still there. I don't know the current update of the project itself. And as far as you know, there wasn't anything wrong with it. It just hadn't moved, and you had to get it moving. That's absolutely correct. Mr. Gilliam, I thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. We go to Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that the statement that the chairman made in the course of his questioning about how your testimony really brings a totally new light to this situation is absolutely correct. I mean, for the better part of a year, we've been conducting these hearings, and we've been dealing on a day, on a, on a, on a project by project basis, as if in fact, for the most part, the game was being played on a level field. That is, decisions were being made on the merits, except for the exceptions. Your closing statement to the chairman's question was that this was the best political machine in town, suggests that, in fact, all of the decisions that were made were made on a non-merit and political basis. Is that accurate? Is that an accurate interpretation or inference? The majority of the projects were made on political basis, correct. Right. Okay. Now, even within that context, I think that for, for the purposes of the record, uh, in response to Mr. Kyle's question, you listed a large number of members of the United States Senate and House of Representatives who made contact with you or with the office that you know of and exerted pressure or made inquiries or whatever. Now, are you saying that all of, in all of those instances, those people were asking you to do improper things in regard to the projects that they were interested in? We were never asked to do improper things directly by, by those, any member of the United States Congress. The, the problem was that we had, uh, the UDAC program was more geared towards the Rust Belt and the Smokestack and Northeast region. That was not the Republican stronghold. Our stronghold was the Sun Belt, the Midwest, and the Far West. And we, had a, we did not have a large pre-40 housing stock. The, the per capita income was much greater. The poverty levels wasn't as low. The unemployment rates weren't as high. So we had to begin to examine on how we could best begin to reach projects in the UDAC program that could reach out to some members of our political party at that time. So that what you're saying is that although the inquiries may not have been and were not improper, the response of your agency was improper that, in fact, what you did was to look around for ways of, of structuring the situation in order to benefit people who otherwise would not have been able to, to utilize the program. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Now, I missed the, the very beginning, and I, I apologize. The planes were late coming in this morning. Uh, so I'm, I may be going on, on um, material that had already been covered. But tell me. Uh, when you first arrived at the agency, what was the 
When was the first time that you were told that, in fact, the game was the political one that you described to us? I can only say this, uh, uh, Mr. Weiss, Weiss, is that when I came to the agency, I was political. So I wasn't going to change. And no one ever objected to what I was doing. So I came from a political background. And when I came to the agency, I just continued rolling on doing what I had been doing. And people began to recognize the fact that I understood HUD programs. I understood how the system worked. I got around the building very well to develop sources of information from people and understanding of the programs. And so I began to just, as questions came up about certain issues, as the secretary began to ask about them, I was able to give him an adequate response, plus be able to go down and work out whatever technical details need to be done. So he and Deborah began to recognize not only my political instincts, but I had the technical expertise to work out those different projects that were what they considered trouble projects, but something they wanted to get done. Now, had you prior to joining HUD in Washington, had you been involved in housing programs of the federal government? On a small scale level, I had been involved in housing programs in Omaha, Nebraska, working with Newsom Construction Company. I had experience in running the governor's, I mean, discretionary funds, because I ran discretionary funds for the governor of the state of Nebraska, uh, former congressman, and then Governor Charles Thone. And can you remember the first instance in which on a UDAC project, you met with the secretary and were told that, in fact, uh, this was to be treated in a political fashion, that it was to be funded, never mind the, the, the merits of the project or never mind the numbers or anything else. When I had meetings with the secretary on any project, let, let me go over two things first. Please. The first two grant agreements I ever signed in the UDAC program or the Nashville uh, Convention Center project and the Apollo Theater project up in New York City. When, when was the Nashville project? Those projects were signed by me in the summer of 1984. Okay. Both of those projects. When the secretary met with me concerning whether it was UDAG or any other discretionary fund that I had oversight, direct oversight over, or my program responsibilities, the statements were, were to me, take a look at it, and I'd like for you to work it out. That was the statements made to me. And I, I took it from that point that that's something that he wanted done, and I was going to put it in technical shape where there wouldn't be any problems on it clearing out of the building as far as any pre audits that were required or any issues regarding the regulations surrounding the program that we were moving funds out of. And did he, in fact, uh, give you those directives in regard to Nashville and the Apollo? Those two were already, those projects had already been funded. What he needed at that time was what they called grant agreements. When a, when a UDAG round occurred and a city was given preliminary notice that their grant had been approved, they needed to have as a part of their closing documents what we call grant agreements. That was the actual commitment from the secretary of HUD to that local jurisdiction who would then enter into what was known as a letter of binding commitment with a development group. That was essential part to because in the due diligence part of it, or in the loan documents, that had to be a part of the closing. And how long had there been a delay prior to your signing off on it, or, or prior to the secretary telling you that, that he really wanted movement on those projects? Those projects, the, uh, the, the project in Nashville had been sitting around for a year, and Apollo had been sitting around for about two years. And again, w is, did you determine the cause for there being, there being that delay? Pardon me? Did you, were you able to determine what the cause of the delay was? Was the, was the secretary reasonable or unreasonable on his request, request or requirement that in fact... And those, and those two, he was reasonable because of the fact that the grant agreements had been sitting around for a long time, that you have to have those grant agreements in order to do the closing. Uh, you had also mentioned a number of names of people within the agency and people at OMB who you say were familiar with the political nature of the decision-making process. And you mentioned at OMB Carol Crawford, and you mentioned at, and I'm just now remembering some of the names uh, from the list in front of me. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, at at the at HUD, you mentioned Deborah Gordine. Uh, Lance Wilson, and were there other people, you mentioned some other people at OMB, who were the other people at OMB? Right. What I indicated was they asked me, the question was posed to me, where did the list go? And I indicated the UDAG list went from, went, Deborah Dean and Secretary Pierce got a copy, and that uh, copies of our UDAG list went over to OMB, to uh, the director's office, the deputy director, and to the associate director. Uh, OMB, as I indicated earlier, had recommended that the UDAC funds be zeroed out completely. They did right. not support the UDAC program. So we always had to clear it through OMB at what levels of funding, how much of the money we could spend, i.e., we would have a total of six rounds a year. Three of those rounds would be what we call large city rounds, cities over 50,000. Three of those rounds would be small cities rounds, cities under 50,000. So we would only have X amount of money to spend within that given calendar year. And many occasions, the administration would submit what they call rescissions to the Hill, but delayed some of our rounds for 45 days, working days, until Congress had an opportunity to act on those rescissions. And now, were you, when you say that OMB had to, had to clear it, do you know, do you know of your own knowledge or with, by, by way of discussions with uh, either the Secretary or Ms. Dean or anyone else uh, at OMB, as to what information was conveyed to OMB with these lists? If they, the only copies that they would have had at that time were the copies that would have been, number one, a draft. Secondly, it would have had the names marked on there of who was supporting those projects. Or who was supporting the projects, so that, that, the, that information they had in hand. It wasn't just the numbers and the cities and the locations. That's correct. It would have, i.e., for example, let's say you were supporting a project out of New right. York. I would put by there, supported by you, and I'd put a D by it. Right. And when you say the director, you mean who, Mr. Miller? I'm saying is that copies went over to that office. The secretary told me that he had to get clearance to OMB on how much money he had to spend. I know that copies of the draft UDAG list projects went over to OMB and those offices. Right. Now, who in those, now, did, the, did Director Miller sit down or the stockman sit down and go over the list one by one by one? I do not know that. Well, you did, uh, did Joe Wright sit down and go over that list one by one by one? I do not know that. Did Carol Crawford do that? I do not know that. Do I know that copies went over there? That I do know. Okay. The reason I ask is because you had mentioned, you had used general uh, titles for, for uh, the director. Uh, and for another title, but then you mentioned Mr. Crawford by name, and so the question that I had was whether, in fact, you knew of your own personal knowledge or by way of conversation, even with any of the people uh, uh, in, a, in a higher position, title position than you, as to whether, in fact, Mr. Crawford directly uh, was, uh, was, was communicated this information. That's Ms. Crawford. Ms. Crawford. Ms. Crawford. Uh, I know that I know for, that the sec we could not spend funds without getting some type of notice or indication or reading from OMB on how much we could spend. Now, did anything come back by way of initialed copies of, uh, of of any of the material that you forwarded? No copies would have come back. Only the amount of money that we were permitted to spend that round. Uh, you also indicated in the course of your testimony uh, that uh, after the final discussion with, uh, with the secretary. You left the room, and I, I assume Miss Dean left the room, or maybe she was still there, and the secretary, the, the light lit up in the secretary's office on the telephone. Right. The, the only person who would have that, that meeting at that time would have been myself. Right. I would, then he called me back in, and he said, I'm going to spend this much money. And then we would proceed into what they call the conference room, where Deborah would join us in the conference room, and uh, along with the undersecretary, along with the assistant secretary for congressional affairs, as, as well as with the uh, deputy undersecretary for field operations. And your, your impression, your inference was, and, and what you were conveying to us in your, the course of your testimony, was that that light on the telephone indicated a telephone call to OMB. Is that what you're telling us? That was my interpretation. Yes.
the uh, discussion about the project that Mr. Morrison was involved in. Uh, how did Senators, Senator White, Senators Weicker and Dodd get involved? Staff. Their staff were present at the meeting, not the Senators themselves. Right. And who invited their participation? They heard about the meeting and asked could they, have, could they attend, and they did. Did they hear about the meeting from you, or did they hear about the meeting from Mr. Morrison? I have no idea. They didn't hear about it from me. Uh, they did not hear about that meeting from me. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was not a personal tete-a-tete -tete that, uh, that Ms. Dean was having with Mr. Morrison on this. this I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a hell of a lot question. of people who were present in that room, from just, just from your description. There was. She was a strange lady. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. And... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, but I just, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, have the record indicate that Chair they're... wants to commend the wisdom of his colleague. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Chairman, I think that those are all the questions that I have at this point. Uh, but again, it, it seems to me that uh, Mr. Gilliam's testimony certainly belies the impression that was created early on and persisted in that uh, people were being taken advantage of by being suggested that they had more than, that they, they only had a, that they had more than just a, a casual involvement in the case of the secretary, for example, uh, in regard to these events. It's quite clear that the secretary, on the base of Mr. Gilliam's stories, at least, is, uh, was, was central to this whole process. And, uh, well, I, again, I think that, that, that it's good that we have a record that at least tries to close the picture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congressman Shays. Thank you. You strike me as a very intelligent man and um, one that, uh, could have played a very constructive role at HUD. Uh, it's clear to me that you didn't. It's clear to me that you were a fixer and um, that you did that job fairly well. It's clear to me that you're very competent. And I guess I just want to first ask you, um, when you got this job, which was a relatively important one, uh, how much were you paid? 75000 was, was that enough money, basically, for you to meet uh, your needs, or did you feel that you needed to make more? I had a feeling I, had, I needed to make more. I was, I, to be honest with you, uh, Mr. Shays, I made some major mistakes. I got greedy. It's the bottom line of it all. <coughs> did, you, did, did you, I'm sorry. I just got greedy, and I'm paying a price for it now. In hindsight, I had more than enough income to live very comfortably for me and my family. When you got this job, was your first reaction, well, now it's my turn, time to cash in or did it kind of evolve? I mean, what, were there some, did you, did you know that this would give you a golden opportunity to, to make some extra money or did you find as you got there that this was the kind of place where that could happen? I felt from the environment, just sitting there and watching some of the things that were, were going on in the way of projects that had been financed prior to my arrival and recognizing names on, on list of uh, people who had received grants, I knew right away that, uh, that this was a golden opportunity in which to do what I do best, and that was to be political. At the same time, I conducted myself in a way in which uh, I did a lot of unethical things. And in hindsight, like I said before, those were very poor judgments in my part. Um, your treatment of David Sowell um, probably is the most un unsettling of all. I mean, I think of this individual who ultimately gets transferred. Did he know at the time that he was being transferred because he was doing his job and uh, you just didn't like the job he was doing? No, I told David Sal I was promoting. Okay. So actually, um, he was given a, an increase in pay? No, lateral movement and an increased program responsibilities of the picture I tried to paint to him. You describe um, certain circumstances where he was involved and he was obviously asking the right questions and so on. In one, you describe a meeting where he's at the, um, you're actually in the secretary's office and you're with a number of individuals. You ask him to leave and you basically read him the riot act and tell him to, to go in and, and, and make this thing work. 
But that was before you had transferred him. This was an event before, correct? That was an event before I transferred him. Okay. The uh, New Haven Project was funded in uh, September of 1986 for $10 million. That's when that meeting occurred. So, I mean, there were examples where he was asking some very difficult questions. <coughs> you were finding that you didn't like his questions and you wanted him to do something differently. When you made it clear that you wanted him to do something differently, uh, he did uh, comply to the wishes of his superior, correct? That's correct. Okay. But in the instance of Lance Wilson and the raising of questions of whether Lance Wilson had the authority to, um, to guarantee the funding and the bonding, uh, there was something new here, and that was that he had gone after someone as important as Lance Wilson? That's correct. Yeah. There also is the very unsettling comment that you made. Um, uh, let me just back up one second. <coughs> Excuse me. Lance Wilson, to your knowledge, was a working partner with Briscoe? On the River Area Beach Project, no. Wedgwood Pla Apartments. Pardon me? Wedgwood, Wedgwood, Wedgwood Apartments and Wedgwood Plaza. In the, in the instance of the Overton Ridge development, which is one of the letters. Yes, sir. And Bell Glade development, which is another letter, which yeah. he signed both, guaranteeing that Payne Weber would take care of the bond. Was he involved in those projects? I don't know if he was involved in a partnership basis on those projects. Pardon me? I do not know whether he was involved in a partnership basis on those two projects. So you don't carry with you any, you didn't have any knowledge that he was um, a partner or going to receive any benefit from Briscoe in, in uh, these, either of these two projects? He would have received some type of benefit if he, either for his uh, forwarding that firm financial commitment or if he had followed through and eventually underwrote the bonds. Okay. Were you trying to help Lance Wilson or were you trying to help Briscoe or were you trying to help both of them? I was trying to help both of them. Okay. Now, it's my understanding that, that you got a, received a phone call from Lance Wilson or from Briscoe that said you needed to get this letter. Just take either one of no, them. No, I, 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 what I did was, how that started off was, I spoke with Lance Wilson on the project, uh, the Belgrade, Florida project, and on the uh, Fort Worth project. And That's I, the Overton Ridge development. Correct. That's the first one that came up. Right, the first one that came up. That should have been dated, what, November 25th, 1986, correct? correct? Yeah, let's take that letter first. All right, in that particular correspondence, I indicated to Lance, uh, we had talked about the fact that, you know, the Texas market was very soft. It was a very, very large project. Uh, that UDAG request uh, was broken down into two phases. And that was about a $34 million project. And I indicated to Lance that uh, it would be very difficult for Briscoe to get a true firm financial commitment from anybody prior to the deadline that was necessary. So therefore, we came up with this uh, situation of submitting that type of letter um, as a firm financial commitment statement to get past the uh, UDAG uh, round. So you were basically anticipating the problems Briscoe would have and, and telling Lance Wilson how he could help resolve those, that, pro that problem. That's correct. Okay. When you went to the secretary to describe the, the um, problem that you were encountering with David Soule, um, there's no implication in any way that, that the secretary was involved financially in this project. So. That's not an issue. No, it's not. The real issue, it seems to me, is that, that you had made it clear to the secretary that there was an individual who was concerned enough to contact the inspector general, David Sold. And I'm interested to know if the secretary, if the secretary said, my gosh, why would he do that? What's wrong with this project? Would he, did he ask any question like that? I mean, no. did it, so he, he didn't show any concern that maybe there's something wrong with this project and maybe he should get David Solon to find out why he would or possibly want to contact the Inspector General? Not at that time, no, okay. sir. Any time later? No, sir. Okay. Now, periodically, you say with hindsight you would have done it differently. Didn't it occur to you at the time that you were bending the rules? So, I mean, there wasn't any doubt in your mind that what you were doing was not proper. No, there was no doubt in my mind. Was there any doubt in your mind uh, in, in, that Lance Wilson felt he was doing anything improper? 
I mean, did you guys know that uh, this is not the kind of thing you would want to broadcast? It's the kind of thing you don't want to broadcast. It, it's true. Okay. Uh, what Lance's thoughts were on what we're doing, uh, I can't answer. But, you know, in hindsight, like I said, that was something we should not have done. Okay. If Lance Wilson were to have been, if this had been discovered by his superiors, that he had written a letter like this, what would have been uh, the penalty that Lance Wilson would have faced? Dismissal. Right. Okay. Now, I wanted um, to just, you've mentioned a number of people. Obviously, you're going to be here three days, and we're going to cover a lot. And some of it might be a bit redundant. But I'm, I'm just uh, thinking of the many hearings we've had, some of the new cast of characters that come in. Briscoe is one of them. There's another individual who comes into play, and that's Michael Karam who was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing in 1981 through 82. Um, now, after he left HUD, uh, it's my understanding he was uh, extraordinarily successful. Yes, he was. And there seems to be this theme of, you know, after you leave HUD, you do pretty well for yourself with HUD. Um, was Mr. Karam one of the major players in, in, in benefiting from his past relationship at HUD? Yes, he did. Okay. Particularly as it relates to UDAGs, did he receive many UDAG grants? Yes, he did. Okay. Uh, if you would, would you list some of those UDAG grants as you recall them? He got one UDAG in Decatur, Georgia for $2,625,000. This is going to go towards the development of a hotel project. In Lorain, Ohio, they got a UDAG for $1,000,000. $378,000 for another hotel development. In Augusta, Georgia, they got a UDAG for $617,000, another hotel development. In Erie, Pennsylvania, they got a UDAG for $3,983,000 for another hotel development. In Biloxi, Mississippi, they got a UDAG for $1,850,000. And in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, there was a UDAG for $2,100,000. The, uh, this is to, for one individual. Help me understand a bit the significance of getting a UDAG grant. I, uh, uh, you did not get involved in moderate rehab, which was really a, a central focus of this committee. But the benefit to, getting a, to being selected and being given so many units was that you could go to a bank and say, I have a constant income stream for 15 years. The bank would, you could get financing to do your project. You didn't make much from the constant. Uh, uh, finan from the financing or the income stream. But what you then got was the tax credits that you could syndicate. And they were significantly, they were very beneficial. You could, you could get the money mm -hmm. up front and, and take out of the project very quickly uh, millions of dollars. What is the significance of a UDAG grant? It helps, it helps provide two things. It gives a, a potential investor or a bank greater comfort in the fact that his risk is lower. Uh, from a 100% or 90% level where their, his risk drops down to like a 60 to 70% level. Let's say if I was able to go in and get a UDAG on a, um, a hotel and I um, was able to raise private equity and private financing of $8 million and I asked UDAG for a grant of $2 million and I was successful in receiving that award. Well, what I would do is I would turn around and develop that project for actually for $8 million because I may have a non-amortizing uh, UDAG loan that would be due upon a balloon payment, hopefully upon refinancing or resale. But what I would do is upon, upon completing construction of that project, that project then has a different appraised value. That appraised value could also include income stream from the hotel as well. So let's say I got an appraised value of 15 or $16 million on a piece of property now that the the non-productive land becomes productive. But then I may be able to get investors or a lender to go 80% of that, of that dollar amount of 15 to 16 million. But what I would do is first pay off my first loan of 8 million, the UDAG of 2 million, and I'd keep the spread on the 80%, 3 to 4 million. That'd be my cash, and I'd be the general managing partner, and I'd manage a project for the investor. But you could take that out very early in the, in the project? You could, what you could do is you could do what is known as a, you would first have a construction loan, mm -hmm. then you have what you call a permit takeout, in which you could do that, because then their project appraised value has increased. 
I didn't add up the sums, but I think it's close to $12 million or thereabouts, UDAC grants. The, um, Mr. Karam obviously had some friends at, at HUD. Who were, who were his friends? He primarily worked with myself and uh, Deborah Dean. On the, on, the UDAG, on the UDAG project. Right. He had projects uh, d that were mod rehab as well? Or? Yes, he did. Okay. Who were his friends there? He worked very closely with the FHA commissioner then, uh, Tom Demery. Mm -hmm. He worked very closely with the DAS desk, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary desk, the multifamily when Silvio was there. And, he, and uh, Michael understood the programs at HUD and he was very successful in, uh, in benefiting from his knowledge of those programs. Let me just um, see how this friendship worked. Let's just take the uh, uh, Birmingham UDAG. Um, my understanding is that Stanley Newman did not put this on the list. Is that correct? David Sal. Pardon me? David Sal did not put it on the list. Okay. He t David, uh, there he keeps coming up. He, he did not have it on the list. Sal was going, he was recommending it for it to be a holdover project. Mm -hmm. um, what happened when it was not put on the list? What did you do with the Michael Kiram? Well, I informed Michael that it wasn't going to be on the list. I don't know if I had time to work it out. That's when he made the statement to me that he was going to call Carol Crawford. I don't know who Michael called, but Deborah gave me a call, asked me about the project, asked me could I work it out. And that's when I brought Sal down and we worked out the project. And okay. it was placed on the list and it was funded. Now. Uh, David Sal also tried to terminate this uh, Sioux Falls UDAG. You stopped him on that? I, yes, I did. Why is that? Well, because Michael Karam then wanted to step in and, and assume the, the project originally was awarded back in 1981 to a different development group. Michael Karam and his associates were going to step in and take over that project and assume the UDAG. Uh, David Sal tried to terminate the project and wanted them to look at the possibilities of coming back in and reapplying again for a UDAG for that project. Also, Roy Priest tried to terminate it, and on, that occasion, on those two occasions, I stopped the project from being terminated so I could transfer the project over to Michael Karam and his associates. Now, in the project of Sioux Falls, was that project all ultimately successful? I don't know whether it was ultimately successful or not. Okay. In 1986, a UDAG was awarded to the Lighthouse Landing Hotel in Lorain, Ohio. Yes, sir. Now, Karen was also the consultant, as you, as you pointed out. Um, what kind of role did he play in getting the, this uh, funded? The UDAG was awarded to uh, the city of Lorain, Ohio, and going through their next step of finally awarding the project to the developer, the city was getting second thoughts on whether to go forward using Michael Karam his associates as a developer. Mm -hmm. Michael contacted me and indicated that he was having problem with the city officials on getting the final agreement done. He asked me could I speak with them. I in turn contacted the mayor and members of his city council and spoke with them over the telephone and informed them that they didn't select Michael Karam as a developer on this project that I was going to terminate the UDAG grant and plus disqualify them from ever receiving community development block grant funds. I did not have the authority to do that, but I realized the mayor and the city council members were not aware of it. An article appeared in the following day's news clippings, and the mayor and the city council subsequently approved the project uh, for uh, the Karam group. Why were you willing to do this for Michael Karam? Because he was a, f uh, uh, a former HUD official, number one, and number two, a fellow political brother. I don't quite know what you mean by a, a fellow political brother. Remember the same party? Okay. In the case of the UDAG for um, Erie, Pennsylvania, which I understand was a fairly decent proposal, what was Kiram's involvement with that project? Michael Kiram was a, a consultant and uh, along with Landmark and, Landmark, uh, and uh, Hospitality Development Corporation. Now, I, I also understand, and I didn't before these uh, hearings and before your involvement, that um, Mr. Karam's home was a popular place for HUD staff to socialize, and that it was uh, known that the staff meetings would also be held there. Is that true? 
Well, I don't know about staff means, but I know that we went out to uh, Michael's uh, home on occasions, and everybody referred to it as a home that HUD built. And so uh, it was a very lovely home. I had a chance to go out there on, uh, he had gave Kentucky Derby parties. And that's so, when I was there. So uh, th obviously there were no staff meetings held there, but there could have been because there were a lot of staff who kept showing up. There was a lot of staff people showed up there. Mm -hmm. um, this gets kind of, I guess, to the question that I wanted to ask you relating to your attitude of what you had to do for former HUD officials. Was the attitude that you had that you'll take care of former HUD officials because someday you're going to be a former HUD official? That's correct. I mean, basically what you did was if a person had been at the agency and they were getting ready to depart, they would share with you the fact that they are leaving and where they're going. And you know you have the year rule where you can't come back into the building because of the ethics laws. And so therefore you knew who they were working with and if a representative from that company came back into you to see you, you tried to work out things with them. Mm -hmm. So there was a, you know, a big open door policy, as you guys have learned from your hearings. People who left HUD during the Reagan administration uh, did very well upon departure. We're going to get into some of this later on, but there's just a plethora of names. Uh, Philip Abrams was, was an individual who uh, worked at HUD, who got lots of projects afterwards. John Allen, excuse me, he wasn't at HUD. Maurice Barksdale was getting UDAG grants. Um, Deborah Gordine was working after she left HUD on HUD projects. Uh, Silvio Di Bartolomez was as well. Are these names that are familiar to you? Yes, they are. Janet Hale? Yes. Even Carla Hills? Yes. Michael Karam? Yes. Um, Gerald Kisner as well? Yes. These are all people that are familiar to you? Yes. Uh, Joseph Monticello? Yes. Linda Murphy? Yes. Um, Alexander Neclario? Yes. J. Michael Queenan? No. That's not a name that's familiar to you? No. Well, Michael Queenan worked with Abrams and, and, um, um, and Wynn and uh, did very well with mod rehabs. Uh, Joe Strauss, yes. name is familiar to you? So these are all people, Bill Taylor obviously, he didn't work at HUD though. No, he did not. Okay. Lance Wilson? Yes. Shirley Weissman? Yes. Philip Wynn? Yes. So it's just a long list of people who seem to be well taken care of after they left. Describe to me um, how much money you made uh, on the outs, uh, basically, excuse me, when you were in HUD, but not from your salary, but from payoffs or whatever you choose to call them, and how much you made once you left HUD? During the time I was at HUD, I, I benefited just under $100,000 in gratuities and cash payments. And when you left HUD? When I left HUD, I was earning close to between seventeen and $20,000 a month. Seventeen and $20,000? Seventeen to 20000 a month. Now, did you make that basically because of decisions you made why you were at HUD, in your judgment? And one particular occasion it was. Okay, what occasion was that? And then well, one Selma, Alabama. Okay. And that's not a UDAG grant or no? Not? Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to uh, defer. I have a few more questions I'd like to come back to. Congressman Schumer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess uh, initially, Mr. Gilliam. Uh, my comments are not different than others. You sit there before us. You seem to be a very intelligent man. You're being very forthright with the committee. Uh, and yet, you're a felon. Uh, you have, when you say these were cash payments, something in me says these were bribes. Isn't that correct? They are bribes. I'd like to know, just start out, what went wrong? Did you ever commit a criminal act before you were in HUD? No. So what happened? I take it you don't intend to commit any criminal acts in the future. You've learned your lesson. No, no more. What, what happened? happened? Power? What was the atmosphere there yeah. that made it? We're not just talking political influence, although we're talking some of that. 
We're talking criminal activity. We're talking bribes. We're talking money that changed hands. What happened to you? Power, greed. Did it happen the minute you walked in there? You surely, weren't there that surely long. Surely after you walked in, it just, it just uh, something that um, in hindsight, um, a maturity should have stepped in or, or maybe legal counsel, but just downright power and greed. And, um, and you're, you're operating with blinds on each side and not really looking at the long-term consequences of what you're doing. You in think my other case, people, that's what occurred. Was it something at HUD that changed you? Or if you had been brought into a different agency that was less political? I should have never been hired at HUD. I should have never been hired in the federal government because of the way... In, in other words, like from the minute do. you were hired, your lack of experience taught you something's up, something's not on the level here to begin with. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. And you were hired, you think, for political reasons? I got in there because I was political. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, quite naturally, you know, um, you could not get a job in a regular administration unless you had worked in the campaign. And I'm put on what you call a must-hire list. I was placed over the agency. Let's take a step back. You worked in the 1984 Reagan campaign. I worked in the 1980 campaign for President Reagan. Okay. And, um, and so I was placed on what they call a must-hire list. Who placed you on that? White House personnel. Okay. And um, I was placed over at HUD. Samuel Pierce was, got loaded up on him a group of young Turks who were very political and on a must-hire list, and we had no housing skills whatsoever. And it sort of set an atmosphere there that this is one big joke. Get from it what you can. Is that, is that unfair to say? We got from it what we could. Did it bother you while you were there? No. Did you ever talk about it with other people? I guess my question is, and I'm not asking for names, do you think other people did the same thing you did and just weren't caught? Yes. You think it was a lot of people, just a few? A few. Okay. I'm both sad and disgusted, is how I am at the moment. You could look at different levels of trouble at HUD. One was political. Now, HUD has always had political overtones to it. That didn't happen in 1980. There have always been long lists of members of Congress and others trying to get HUD projects. But that sometimes leads to trouble. A second level is, I guess, what I'd call wrongdoing, where the kind of, at least in the first, you would think, well, someone makes a call, but the project has merit, real merit, and it's considered and granted. The second is wrongdoing, manipulating the process so a certain project occurs. You've mentioned several of those the one at Hampton, and most of the ones you've mentioned were like that, or the secretary setting the list, not on the merits of how much money is available, but on what project he wanted and then getting that. And the third is criminal. And of course, then there's the category that doesn't meet any level of wrongdoing, which is strictly a decision made strictly on the merits on its own. Of the decisions made at HUD, could you categorize which, how much each how many times were the decisions made strictly on the merits, no politics? How many times were they made for political reasons without wrongdoing? How many times wrongdoing but not so far as criminal? And then some of the ones that you and Lance Wilson were involved in seemed to be criminal. Give us some idea of that. I couldn't give a, a firm asking, answer to it, but I would say that in the technical assistance program, which we'll be discussing uh, later this week, on that particular fund, during the time I was there, only one project got funded that was non-political. There was only one project that wasn't political? Out of about 200. How about you, Dag? The vast majority of those projects uh, at the top of the list were, good, were, were very good projects. So you had some on the merits, a significant a number large on the merits. On the top, the bottom part was where the, the merit issues would come into play. Okay. You mean the political and then wrongdoing criminal? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing is very clear, though, that the kind of projects that this committee examined earlier on, which were just abusive, were hardly uh, atypical. They happened regularly and all the time. That was part of the process of doing business at HUD. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah, especially when you got li the problem. One of the problems HUD was faced with is the fact we had limited resources. Uh, let's just step on the mod rehab program just for a moment. When you only have 5,000 units and you have 20,000 requests or 25,000 worth of requests in, well, those 5,000 units have gone, become very, very valuable. So people then are willing to pay 1,000, 1,500 to $2,000 a unit just to get 50 or 100 because they were very difficult to get because we didn't have enough. When you say pay, what do you mean pay? I mean consultants were charging 1000 $1,500 or $2,000 per unit for mod rehabs. Mm -hmm. And because of the fact they had a high demand. And the smaller the, demand, the smaller the number of mod rehab units that were available, the higher the demand or cost for the units went. Uh, just again, while you were there, it never entered your mind that what you did was wrong. Even when you took these bribes, these cash payments, as you phrase them, you thought that was okay. Could you just give us some of your thought process? I'm sure you've had time to think about it and have thought about it. At the, I time, at the time, I didn't, think it, I didn't think anything about it. I was just doing it. Uh, in hindsight, uh, when you have that downtime like I'm having right now, you, you're quite naturally going to have second thoughts about it because of the situation you're in. But um, it was wrong. It's just downright wrong. I did it. I'm not going to deny it. I've been convicted of it. And that's the bottom line of all. Okay. I'd like to go on. Uh, your testimony obviously directly contradicts Secretary Pierce and his testimony here. In fact, uh, I'd say your testimony is the smoking gun, tainted though it might be because of your record. And I'd like to ask you a little bit about that. When I questioned Secretary Pierce on May 25th before this committee, I was asking him what kind of involvement he had. And he said, quote, my line was always the same. This is to the staff. Let's give this careful consideration. If it's worthy, if it meets our requirements, fine. If it doesn't, it doesn't make it. That is not how he operated. Is that correct? Those statements were not made to me. I understand that. They, made, they were made to the public. They're part of the record. I'm asking you for your view. Did Secretary Pierce only say, let's look at it on the merits, let's give this one careful consideration, or did he go beyond that? The statements to me, the Secretary Pierce say, I want you to take a look at this, and I want you to get it done. That Which meant he made to me fund it. That means fund the project. I would put it in, sh in, the, in the technical terms in a form that met regulatory statutes. Okay, here's another quote. This one's in Time magazine. He says, my general operating procedure was to send each request to the appropriate staff at HUD with instructions to consider it carefully, and if the request met the necessary requirements, grant it. If not, deny it. That's not what you find, right? That's not the way I operate, no. Is that the way Secretary Pierce operated? Not with me. Did you see him operate that, uh, the way he operated with you with other people? With Deborah Dean. Same way. Same way. You heard him say to her, fund it. To get that project out. Get that project okay. out. Okay. You know, he, there's another statement here where this is in response to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, Congressman Shays asked the secretary, did you ever ask Deborah Gordine to fund a particular project and convey that to anyone else? Secretary says, not that I recall, I don't remember telling her to fund any. I never told these people to fund anything. Your judgment, that's not true. Your that's not the way, of what yeah, happened. The, not, the way he dealt with me, we didn't deal that way. We dealt differently. Mm -hmm. And we've had other people, Shirley Wiseman and Janet Hale, say the same thing. So there are more and more fingers pointing to the fact that uh, this is the way things happened at HUD at the very top, and it permeated its, uh, its way down. Let me ask you a question. I mean, this is a public hearing. Why should the public believe you rather than the secretary? Because at this point, I don't want to be convicted of, of uh, lying before Congress. OK. I have a few more questions. These are about some of the specifics. One is about this, uh, the Lance Wilson letter. 
Did anyone, well, one about uh, yeah, the Lance Wilson letter, you knew it was a phony. Did anyone else tell you, despite the fact that it was a phony, it was okay to do and accept, or was this totally derived in your own mind? Derived in my own mind. No one, you never talked to any, this was a little secret between you and Lance Wilson. That's correct. Anyone else know the secret? Bud Briscoe was aware of it. Bud Briscoe. Anybody else? No. Okay. I don't know if you know, did Payne Weber never found out about this in their own internal systems in any way? I don't know the answer to that. No, but to your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. It never, it never came back up. Now, when you met with the secretary about David Sowell, and I know that Mr. Kyle has gone over this, but I think, I think it's worth going over just once again. While it was certainly not clear, and certainly no one is saying it is, that either the secretary benefited financially or even knew the specifics of the falsity of this letter, it was clear that one of the reasons to move Sowell away is that he was calling the 800 number all the time. Isn't that correct? Yes. And the 800 number was the number to the IG. It's the hotline to the IG. Hotline to the IG. So that, at least from the secretary's point of view, it seemed pretty clear that Sowell was being removed, at least in part, because he was calling the IG and telling him things. That much we would know. Is that correct? As a part of my statements on the reason we should move him, I did indicate that. Yes, sir. Okay. Have you mentioned all the gratuities and sort of freebies that you've received uh, to the committee? Yes, sir. Uh, and here today? There are a few program errors they haven't touched on yet, but I've indicated to you the total dollar amount that I received in the way of gratuities and payments right. while at HUD. Do you know of any other instances, not where there were, quote, cash payments, bribes, but these kinds of things, clothes, uh, trips, these kinds of things that were given to other employees at HUD? Was it sort of known that so-and-so would take you out to a restaurant, that so-and-so would give you and your family a free trip here? What kind of clothes was it, by the way? Was it a whole wardrobe, or was it a shoelace? I mean... It was a wardrobe of clothing. A whole wardrobe of clothing. Um, and you knew that was wrong when you accepted it? Yes. Okay. Uh, other HUD employees, was it sort of well known at HUD that certain people would give these, provide these gratuities to people? There were, there were a lot of gratuities going on at HUD. I couldn't indicate to you who, who was doing what, but as people could tell from expense accounts from developers, we were very busy eating a lot of food as well. Okay, the restaurants are one thing. What about other things? Trips, I think they're a step above even. Trips, wards, wardrobes of clothes. I can only address to trips my, to New York to go to the show. You I can only I can only discuss with you my own personal experience. No, but I'm I asking. I, you have, and yeah. very frankly, to yeah. your credit, you have. I'd like to know. You say that it was sort of known around that there were lots of freebies and things. Did those freebies extend beyond uh, meals? Yes. Can you describe? I, I, can you I can't. I can't. I. I I, what I'm trying to say is... You have a very good memory. I mean, that's... <laughs> I don't know for a fact who, who received what trips to go where. I'm not asking, but... Okay. But I am asking, just give it a little... I'm not saying on March 24th, so-and-so took a trip paid for by so-and-so, but could you give us a little more detail? You say it was around. What do you mean? I think as you begin to get into investigation, you'll find that HUD officials accepted trips in, in uh, hotel rooms and other places in the country. Mm -hmm. How about clothes? I think you'll find clothing. I, I, and I can't say the I can't give an answer on cash payments. No Vicuna coats or anything like that. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I I just would say to you in conclusion, Mr. Gilliam, that uh, you've made it clear that it's worse, I guess, than we all thought. And uh, I just hope uh, your words and whatever we can do make sure it doesn't happen again. No more questions, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Shays has a few more questions, Ms. Gilliam. 
I'd like to ask you, uh, we have had a number of uncooperative witnesses. Eventually, Secretary Pierce was one of them. Lance Wilson was another. Deborah Gordine, you've mentioned all three of those. Um, but we haven't mentioned one of them, which is Hunter Cushing, who took Michael Karam's place uh, as the Secretary for Multifamily Housing. What is the significance of the position of Secretary of Multifamily Housing at HUD? Oh, it's a major, it's a major desk at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. You have two major desks uh, in the whole organization. The first one is Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing. That desk has a responsibility for the uh, used to be HODAC program, Housing Development Action Grant program, existing Section 8 vouchers, loan management set aside program, 202 program, uh, the moderate rehabilitation program, and also the property disposition unit area. At the desk I, 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 I obtained, we ha I have responsibility for UDAG. And the secretary and, this, and you're considering the desk you had as this as the also the second. Uh, in other words, those are the two: the one that Hunter Cushing eventually had, and the one that you had as being the two key ones. Those are the two major desks. Okay. And again, why is yours the key one? Because I had the uh, secretary discretionary fund program, and the UDAC program, and plus while at the agency, <coughs> I began to expand and broaden my uh, my role at HUD by getting involved in Hunter's desk. Is is it? Is the, your message basically that they were too powerful desks because they were discretionary as opposed to block grants or formulas? That's HUD. Those, outside of Janie May, that is HUD, those two desks. That is the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development right there. But you had a lot of discretion. A did lot of discretion. Did someone like Tom Demery, I mean, you know, this whole investigation had, had his name on it. Was Tom Demery in a position of as much power as you or Cushing, Hunter Cushing? Demery uh, came in and understood, understood the programs, but by the time Tom Demery got there, uh, the HUD organization was way down the road on the way it was operating. Yeah. What do you kind of, I mean, this is somewhat of a di digression, but in other words, was he like you, someone who came in and said, my turn to cash in, or, or w are you kind of giving me a different I think I think he came in and recognized that, uh, that, that the deputy of success, such a secretary for multifamily housing desk was having a direct line upstairs with the executive assistant on input into the FHA programs. And FHA Commissioner Demery wanted to establish himself as the one uh, in control of FHA. Was, did he ever gain control of FHA, to your knowledge? No. Uh, I want to ask you about one last project, and that's the Palladium in Baltimore which was funded in 1986. And the, my understanding is the city of Baltimore had not acted on it and the project was not moving. Uh, can you tell us how this project first came to your attention? Well, how it came to my attention was that uh, co former Congressman Perry Mitchell had uh, asked Deborah to look into this project and Deborah called me about it and I asked uh, Deborah, I told Deborah, I didn't ask Deborah, I told Deborah I'd look into it right away. I consequently met, uh, subsequently met with a representative from uh, former Congressman Perry Mitchell's office who, who then told me what some of the problems were in the project and I arranged a meeting with Marion Pines who at that time worked for the city of Baltimore in the community, community plan and development capacity and I also um, had the developer down as well as a representative from uh, Perry Mitchell's office. At that uh, meeting I was looking at some of the problems that the city was indicating they were having as far as the developer not coming up with certain financing, et cetera. So I asked Marion Pines, let's step out in the hallway and have a talk for me down in my office so I could really find out what was going on. Uh, Ms. Pines indicated to me that the reason that they were not moving forward on the project is because the developer of the project uh, was a, allegedly a drug dealer. And the family had been very heavily in, in drugs and they were being monitored by the, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency and the, and the local uh, police officials in Baltimore. And then after talking to her, I had the developer come down and I talked to him privately. And then the developer, I indicated to him, is it my understanding that you were involved in drug dealing? He told me he was not. I told the developer I would work the project out for him. I wanted him to be certain though that he did not use that business of operation which was gonna be a catering service with storage capacity. I did not want him to use that as a storage for drugs, a distribution point for drugs, and if he did, I was going to call the Drug Enforcement Agency myself. 
Why, why were you interested in, in funding this project? Well, there was a minority developer involved in the project, and it seemed like to me it was a good idea what he wanted to do. He wanted to provide basically a place for people to go and uh, have a dining hall. Okay. Let me just uh, say, you, you, you mentioned that you received while at HUD approximately $100,000, which will really pay off, this, and 17000 monthly after you left. I'm not going to ask you to account for all the $100,000. we are we are dealing with UDAGs today, but how much of the 100000 was connected to UDAGs? About uh, 40 percent. And have you mentioned all the people that contributed or, or paid, made those payoffs? Who are the individuals? In the UDAG program? In the UDAG programs. I have. Okay. Can you refresh me as to who they are? I indicated it was Leonard Briscoe. Yeah. Robert Thompson, Lance Wilson, and Michael Karam. Okay. Um, and Lance Wilson's was basically in the form of hotels and so on. And limousine service. Okay. It, it strikes me, I mean, just this is somewhat of an observation, the, 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 the accusations against the secretary have nothing to do with him receiving money for his interest in these projects. The message I'm getting from you is that he had a political job and he uh, did his political job. I'm not saying he should have viewed it this way. The view I'm getting is that he had a political job and there were certain people he made sure got funding. Um, and you seem to be tying in <coughs> the White House in some efforts with uh, the suggestion of what projects should be funded. You also seem to, to say that uh, he took an interest in certain kinds of individuals like Lance Wilson. In other words, Lance Wilson was obviously someone he paid special attention to and, and wanted his projects funded. So I guess in summary, would you say that some of his decisions were based on politics? Yes. And some based on his personal relationships? Yes. Yeah. You are not saying, or are you saying that you think he received remuneration in any way, financial? No way. I, I don't believe in the bottom of my heart, nor I ever believe the Secretary Pierce mm -hmm. ever took any sort of gratuity or kickback uh, while at HUD. Okay. So basically, the Secretary's problem as it relates to this committee may be that he didn't run HUD the way it should be run, uh, and number two, that uh, he may have, in fact, perjured himself when he said before this committee that he didn't try to influence projects. That, it seems to me, is the, is the challenge for Mr. Pierce before this committee. Let me um, just ask you one other thing. In terms of the 17000 monthly, that's a tidy sum of money. Um, the um, how much of that was related to, say, past activity with UDAG? How much did Mr. Briscoe pay you, for instance, in the 17? Uh, when I first, I didn't go to work for Mr. Briscoe until January of 1987. Okay. And I went on a retainer fee with Mr. Briscoe for 3,500 plus expenses, which amounted to about 5,000 a month. <coughs> Frankly, I'm struck by the fact that you were a good bargain for him. In fact, um, I know there must be an attorney out west who's very grateful. You got him $100,000 approximately, and he um, was very happy to keep it all. Uh, but you were the one who had directed that money to that attorney? Yes, sir. Okay. Did that attorney ever deny the fact that um, he received it because of what you had done? I don't know. I've, I haven't spoken with him. Okay. Did you feel like he didn't keep his side of the bargain? Or do you feel he never made a bargain in the first place? He gave me his opinion on the fact that what we were doing would come back to haunt us, and that was the bottom of that. Well, that seems to suggest something that I just want to investigate mm -hmm. with you. I get the feeling that sometimes you would have agreements without actually stating it to the individual, that sometime in the future you would help this guy now, and sometime in the future you want to be benefited. Did you let this attorney know earlier on that you were going to direct some business to him? Yes. So you let him know you were going to direct some business to him. You had implied at that time that you hoped that, that he would uh, benefit you in the future. I mean, did you have any specific kind of conversation with him? Yes, I did. Well, I'd like to know about that. I basically told him I was going to direct some business his way, and upon me leaving government, I, I wanted some participation. And did he say that would be wrong at that time? Not that time. So at that time, this attorney had no problem. He didn't, it didn't, nothing, uh, you know, kicked in his mind that he should tell you this would not be appropriate. Not at that time, but after he went back, he did not, he was not familiar with the ethics laws. Well, you don't have to be a genius yeah. to know. I mean, I uh, might, well, I wager most people okay. would know that. Right. And I, I want to pursue this, pardon me? Especially if 
Yeah, okay. Well, I'm not so sure, but... Um, um, the, um, I guess the point I want to ask you is that you, you suggested to this attorney that you would be able to direct some business to him, and you also suggested to him that you would hope in the future that you would receive some benefit. At that time, the attorney didn't say, well, that's illegal or wrong or a bad idea. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. At the time, how much business did you direct to that attorney? In total? Total. About $200,000. So you directed approximately $200,000. Did you... And round, and round figures. And round figures. Well, I'll, I'm willing to take $25,000 off either way, and it's a, but it's a sizable sum of money. Over a period of how long? That was done all within about a year. Okay. And um, were you then getting in legal problems that made this attorney think, well, you're a bad risk? Were there questions being raised about you at that time? No, not at that time. Okay. So y what did you do? Did you contact the attorney and say, by the way, I'm, I'd, I'd like some of that back? Or what did that, you do? That's correct. And that's when he told me that, you know, they couldn't do it because it was, you know, it was unethical and it would be problems. He said he just couldn't do it. So there's two parts. The one, it was unethical. The second was problems. What did he mean by problems? It was illegal for us to do that. Okay. Now, um, so he realized after he got the, the, the business that it was illegal. Did you say to him uh, anything about that? He just accepted it, walked away? Yeah. I, di I didn't comment because I couldn't force him to do it. You know, I'm just struck by the fact that you made a lot of people very wealthy. Yes, I did. He sure did. Um, I think that concludes. I guess my last question would be with Leonard Briscoe. Your introduction to him was, was how? How did you, how were you introduced? I met him through Lance Wilson. Okay. So Lance Wilson, I mean, Leonard Briscoe, it's, it almost strikes me as the same kind of arrangement with you and the attorney. I mean, in this case, uh, you introduced the attorney to a number of individuals who made this attorney far fairly wealthy um, in a very short period of time. Now, you had Lance Wilson introduce you. How, how did he introduce you? And, and what, I met Leonard Briscoe for the first time in November of 1985 when we were beginning to sit down and go over the repayment structure of Wedgwood Plaza, I mean, excuse me, Wedgwood Apartments in, in Riviera Beach, Florida. Now, were you as direct with uh, Leonard Briscoe that you could make him, uh, you could do some things for him and would hope something happened in return? That conversation didn't take place that way, but there was a, there was a, a nonverbal understanding. Yeah. Tell me how a nonverbal understanding works. If you ask me what can you do for me and I tell you to use this lawyer, and he did, that's the end. That's why. That's how I did it. Okay. Uh, but but you you were Le Leonard Briscoe gave you some payments, correct? Or yes, was he did. Uh, bef while you were at HUD. While I was at the agency. And and also after you left HUD. Yes, sir. Okay. I guess I'll c conclude with this um, question about the Inspector General. Um, what was your relationship with the Inspector General? Poor. Poor. Um, <laughs> For the record, you said poor? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Um, and it was, it was not a good relationship because uh, you think Paul Adams knew you cut corners or because you just were stood up to him or just told him to go, you know, drop dead? Or, I mean, what, what constituted a poor Paul relationship? Paul Adams knew that I was cutting corners and I was doing some things that I had no business doing. I'm sorry, you spoke so quickly. And Paul you Adams was aware that I was cutting corners right. and I was involved in some activities that I should not be involved in and they were questionable legally. And did he ever write you up in any bad way that you recall? Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. He wrote me up a lot on the, his IG reports as far as the Secretary's discretionary fund was involved, concerned and uh, as far as um, some ongoing activities in the UDAC program. Okay. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few more questions, if it's all right with you, Ms. Gilliam, uh, from Congressman Weiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And they are just very few questions. Um, when you, you said that there were names attached to the lists that w went to the uh, secretary as to who was sponsoring or, or behind uh, the SHUDAC projects and that the secretary's list, in essence, went over to OMB uh, with those names on it. Did Wilson's, did Lance Wilson's name appear when, in fact, he was behind some of the projects? No. 
But the, how would the secretary know that Lance Wilson was behind the, some of the projects? I would, in, I would inform him, and Lance would have already made contact with him. With the, with the, the secretary. secretary directly? Yeah. So that the secretary knew that a number of the, the projects that Lance Wilson uh, was behind were, in fact, being awarded on a non-meritorious basis, but on a personal contact basis. Is that correct? He never questioned me about the merits of the project. He never got into market feasibility, repayment terms, or performance statements. You would just go to him and say, this is, uh, this, this is Wilson's project, Lance, Lance's project? That's correct. Or he would tell you that, that uh, were there instances where he would tell you, this is Lance's project, I want this funded? On the Rivera Beach uh, apartments in November of 1985, he indicated he knew those were Lance's projects because he asked me about it. And I told him it was at the top because it was a pocket of poverty. And the um, Wedgwood Plaza project that was funded in July of 19, well, it had been June of 1986, uh, the secretary uh, was not, uh, didn't, was, I indicated to him that's Lance's project. Then the Bell Glade project in March of 1987, I indicated to him with Lance's project. Right. So that when, when in fact, uh, you, ha you went to him with, with the information that uh, David Soule was raising questions about a project that Lance Wilson was involved in, the secretary at that point knew that part of the problem was that, in fact, he had signed off on and approved a number of Lance Wilson's projects where merit was not taken or, or the numbers were not taken into account. Is that correct? I have to say that that's true, but that was the way it was. He never got into any of the projects in that form as far as looking at their um, repayment structures, their performance statements or the description of the projects. He only got involved to the point of looking at uh, who uh, was involved in the project and how much is being requested. That's the only right. project he got and, involved but, in. And so he knew that when, when in fact, the questions were being raised uh, by David Soule, that, in fact, that meant uh, problems because of the manner in which these projects were, had been approved. Is that correct? I can't, I can't answer that question. I. Uh, I can only tell you what I told him about Sal, and we respond, he responded based off of my statements about David Sal. I guess what I'm trying to stay away from saying, because I don't think it's true, but that is the fact the Secretary never got involved in the due diligence or underwriting of any of the UDAC projects. And, and that's what I'm trying to say. So therefore, he would not know whether this project was a good project or a bad project. He assumed by getting that far that it made all the, met all the requirements in which they did. So when he made a decision, on reaching out a certain project, it met all the regulatory uh, requirements and, and complied with the UDAG policies. Then why would why would he want David? Why was he concerned about David Soul? Because of the statements in which I made to him. And you said to him, I said to him that Sal was a was a problem. About he had contacted Lance's boss, which had caused him a career problem at Payne Weber, and I also indicated to him that Sal. Uh, was calling the 800 number and could be a problem as far as the IG, and we should move him. But you, you very clearly spoke about the IG being, being involved in the situation. I indicated the fact that Sal uh, would be a problem from that, from that point, yes. Okay. Uh, tell me, how often did you meet with, uh, with the secretary alone on, on UDAC projects? I met, with him, kind of projects? I met with him only during the time when we were about doing the, for example, during the month of August, there'd be very few meetings, but as we got closer into the UDAG round after the 15th of September, um, our meetings became more frequent, like uh, three times a week. And then as far as the uh, other programs that I had responsibility for, we had conversations or meetings at least once a day. At least once a day? Once a day. Either phone call or person, in person. Year round? Year round. And was that, were those meetings alone uh, between you and the secretary? On the program I was doing within the secretary's discretionary fund, yes. Okay, and how often would you meet uh, with the secretary and the company of Ms. Dean? On the secretary's discretionary fund? Only when we were going to be sitting down and going over what TAs to fund. Uh, for, on, any, on any basis, how often would you meet with, uh, with the secretary and Ms. Dean? Only on, only on that occasion, and on a couple of occasions, Deborah sat in that office when we were going over the UDAG list to determine the cutoff points. So then the programs that, that you were responsible for, 
Ms. Dean played no role at all. There was no middle middle person. Oh, she was involved in them, yeah. She was involved when her and I would be meeting one on one, and then as we met to to decide on a what projects to fund in the TA program of the Secretary's Creation Fund, she was a part of that meeting. Okay. And then finally, just so that the record really is complete, I had asked you earlier that uh, just because members of Congress made inquiries or uh, urged the approval of their projects didn't mean that they were doing anything wrong and you had agreed with that. Yes, sir. And included in that, I, I included in my mind, if I didn't mention him by name, Mr. Morrison said there'd be no question about it. Whatever, whatever Ms. Dean's own peculiar uh, concerns or, or attractions may have been, uh, that that was not Mr. Morrison's doing. That was her own it, within her own mind. Yes, Mr. Morrison. You know, he just did what a normal representative of this body would do as far as putting support behind a local project. Good. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. I think Mr. Schumer has a question. Just one more question. I'm sorry, Mr. <laughs> uh, Gilliam. I know you're. This has not been an easy experience for you. Why were you caught? Why do you think you were caught and nobody else was? I mean, you're the one person. I think if, uh, check me if I'm wrong, who has been convicted of crimes out of the h swamp at HUD. There's one other? No, but one so far. Uh, and yeah, there's Robin Hood. Why do you, but you, uh, as a high level official at HUD, why do you think that is? I did, well, I did wrong, and a lot of people had suspicions about it, and so I was closely monitored. No, I understand like I that, but no you said you thought others might have done the same thing. Uh, I mean, that's how come I kept no calendars, I kept no phone numbers, I kept everything in my head so nobody could tr put any traces on me. And so uh, what happened in my case, I left an enemy behind who kept some hotel receipts. And the IG picked up on that and some travel tickets. That's what happened in my case. Without the hotel receipts, you never would have been I caught? I never would have been caught. No more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one final question. Uh, which is a broad one. Uh, there is no reason for you to know, Mr. Gilliam, but I am strongly in favor of all governmental agencies to have as few political appointees as possible. I have legislation, for instance, with respect to the State Department that would dramatically cut the number of political ambassadors and increase the number of career ambassadors. The Deputy Assistant Secretary level at HUD seems to be a, a very important level which certainly, in terms of competence, career people ought to be able to fill. Do you think that the Deputy Assistant Secretary level positions in the future at HUD should be filled by career appointees or political appointees? I think as a compromise, certain deaths should be uh, become career, without a doubt. Uh, the uh, vice president for Jenny May should be a career position. The uh, deputy assistant secretary for multifamily housing should be a career position. And also the deputy assistant secretary spot with program responsibility over the community development block grant program, rental rehabilitation program, and the secretary discretionary funds. They would bring a continuity of management, strong management, to those programs and bring some stability and good policy direction. So when you do have a new executive branch that comes into office and when it's just a secretary comes over, rather than trying to get immediately into a lot of program policies and decisions, they really have a experienced uh, person who's there and who has familiarity with all the, the problems confronting the agency at that time. Well, that's very helpful, and when we make all of our recommendations and legislative recommendations, we will certainly take this into account. We look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday. I want to thank you for a very forthright and helpful testimony. This hearing is adjourned. The subcommittee will continue to hear testimony from Du Bois Gilliam on Wednesday and Friday of this week. C-SPAN's cameras will attend both days of hearings. Please watch for schedule updates for information on when the hearings will air. Up next, a recorded viewer call-in program with Congressman Ted Weiss, who was present at today's HUD hearing.
Good evening from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN. We're taking a short break.